Hello, everybody. Welcome. Just getting started in the pre-show. Nine minutes to show time. If you're watching this on the replay, you can fast forward about nine minutes, and you'll be in pretty good shape when you change the home page. I got these random pictures that pop up when I open a new tab. I've got the bird feeder going on the other stream over here. It's a nice day out. Let's come back to that. Uh, I need to adjust the website so that the front page looks a little different with the promo bar. And what else do we need to do? My Network Plus Study Group is right now. Click here to join us. And it's slash live. And save changes. That's done. Let's see, I was going to do something else too. Why did I pop open that tab to begin with? Oh, lights. We need lights. It's so dark in here. So let's do lights. Uh, let's turn on all of the lights. And go. What a difference. Get the background. There we are. Now we can do a show. Let's do, uh, let's do some camera checks. It's a little bit. I'm a little low. A little low in the, in the frame. Uh, Chan number two, number three, number four, we're good. But I'm just a little bit, I wonder if I adjust it now, if I'll ruin my life. Let's find out, shall we? Let's do this. Ba, 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 ba. Ba, 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 All right, here we go. Down just a little. Just a little bit. Isn't very much. Let's try that. I'm a little happier with that. Just a, just a little bit. Just a. It's never gonna be perfect. It's never, it's never the way I want it. It's never exactly what I want. Uh, how's it look if I do this on this side? Yeah, it looks fine. All right, that works for me. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the chat room. I guess I could put a live link in there for the folks that are hanging out. If you're watching this on YouTube on the live stream, then you're not getting a chat. You need to go to professormesser.com slash live to get the chat. How are things out there right now? Things are uh, things are nice. Things are very nice. Uh, what is the temperature? It's uh, 70 degrees and overcast. Not overcast much anymore. The sun has come out. Should get warm today. 21.1 degrees C. I don't know what that C stands for. That sounds cold. Maybe that's what it stands for. I know what the C stands for. Um, what else do we need to do on this thing? I think we're in pretty good shape. Me thinks. Um, got a presentation probably start that right now. There we go. Let's make sure people are showing up. That would be good. Oh, yeah, there you are. Hi, everybody. The uh, email should go out in about 20 seconds and the Twitter and the Facebook and all of those good things. So we should know more shortly. Shortly. Um, all right. Presentation's up. That looks good first slide um what else what else do we need to do i think that's it i've got uh i've got this got that ba, 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 ba. Ba, 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 there's uh what is today today's the eighth okay Got a package delivery tomorrow. It's telling me I need a signature. I'm like, well, I'm busy right now. I got stuff to do. So there you go. Ba, 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 ba. We've got uh, lots of good questions today. I don't know that I have anything that's too earth shattering. Try to mix it up a little bit. Did I put a thing in here about the stuff? I think I did. Yeah. Yeah, I put a thing in there about the stuff. Always announcements. Always something to talk about. Why is this 
Why is it pulling on my head today? Because I'm sitting on it. See? Highly technical. If you sit on the cord, it will pull your head down. <laughs> what if we got uh, time-wise? We're in pretty good shape. Uh, three and a half minutes. Three and a half minutes. Three and a half minutes. Let's go back to this. It's so much better to hang out. There's no birds today. Where'd they all go? You know where they might have gone? I wonder if I can pull this up without. Where they might have gone? I've got a thing that I can show you. Where they might have gone? Uh, can I pull it over? <laughs> no, because it's full screen. Uh, now it's not. So this is the bird feeder that you see on the live stream right here. Uh, this is the camera that I've hidden inside a birdhouse. Not really hidden, but it sort of protects it. And it's not obvious that a camera is out there and it kind of looks nice. It's kind of close, but uh, it looks a lot closer here in the picture. But on top of this, here, here's why I think there may not be a lot. This is from yesterday. Uh, it's a red-shouldered hawk. I think it's a female. And she's looking for something for her kids. Something live and delicious. And uh, she was just hanging out there yesterday. I happened to snap a shot from my, uh, my security cam. And that's, uh, that's sometimes that may be why there's nothing in the bird feeder. Because this, this person, this very large animal, is sitting on top and waiting for something to happen. So I thought that was interesting. So that was, uh, that was yesterday. That was before the storm. All right. How are we doing on time? Two minutes. Two minutes. Go. No. Minutes. Very windy out, isn't it? Last night was a pretty bad storm around uh, 8 p.m. local. Yeah, that particular, those particular hawks don't really eat fish. They really go after squirrels and mice. They don't really hunt water in the water. Because I, have, as you can hear, I have water that's nearby, so... There you go. Ba, 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 ba. In order to renew Network Plus, there's a list of third-party renewals that is available on the CompTIA website. If you go to comptia.org, uh, there is a renewal section. Oh, what is with the looping red lights? My Cylons? That is a video recording. Those are Black Magic Hyper Decks. Uh, there's two of them. There's one Black Magic Hyper Deck that records to SSD everything that you see, which is on this right screen that is in front of me. There's also a preview channel that I see uh, that's on the left side. And I can punch a button and you'll see the preview channel. So this preview channel is also recorded. So I'm effectively recording both at the same time. Really, just for redundancy's sake here, I'm also recording on my video switcher itself, the TriCaster, and we're recording on YouTube. But I like to have two copies. Usually when I'm creating content for uh, my courses, that's what I'm recording with. One is recording the head, and the other one is recording the screen. And then I'll take the two files from both of those and put them in a video editor, and that's how you end up getting the, uh, the training videos. And I'm just hitting both at the same time. They're recording together, and then I sync them up. They both have the audio on them, so I sync them up with the audio track. And I'm able to get perfect synchronization. And that's how that works. Isn't that great? All right. It's time to uh, it's time to a thing, everybody. Let's uh, we're recording, we're recording, we're live here, we're live there. Okay. Hello everyone. Welcome to the February 2017 Professor Messer Network Plus Study Group. This is my monthly study group where I ask you questions about the Network Plus certification and online as if by magic. You're able to answer the questions. We'll all see how we do. And we're able to hopefully learn something before the hour is over. This is something I like to do because you show up. If you didn't show up, 
there wouldn't be much of a study group. So thanks for joining me on this live stream. If you're not here for the live stream, make sure you check in and see when the next one is at professormesser.com slash calendar. I always have a list of what the latest events are. You can see them there. Of course, you can also follow me on Twitter and on Facebook and on YouTube and on anything that you might think of. Type in professormesser.com slash the name of the thing you would like to follow me on. Not on everything, but you can find me on many things. Think of it as a, a some type of hunt, and, and maybe you'll find under a slash something that I suddenly show up somewhere you weren't expecting. So that, that'll be fun, wouldn't it? I don't know about fun, but it's something to do anyway. You can always ask me, of course, and I'll be glad to tell you if you're looking for me on a particular social media outlet. Also, don't forget about the voucher link. Don't pay full price for your vouchers. Thanks to my friends at GTS Learning, you can get a 10% discount right off the top. Check that out at professormesser.com slash vouchers. I would not be able to do the study group if it were not for your support, not just watching the videos, which I am grateful for. And please continue to watch every minute of every video I put out there. I take every course. They're all available to watch for free. I don't hold anything back. There's nothing special behind the scenes. There's no paywall. There's none of that nonsense. All of the videos are there. 100% of them for you to watch. Uh, you, you, there are also some folks would like to have an offline version, though. Maybe you'd like to have MP3 files to listen to in the car. Maybe you'd like to have uh, videos that you can play when you're not connected to the internet, or maybe you don't have great internet connectivity. So you can, of course, check that out at professormesser.com slash getnetplus, G-E-T-N-E-T-P-L-U-S, getnetplus. Um, I've also... By the way, got tests that are online. Don't know if you've seen these. These are relatively new in the last few months. So these are quizzes that I have on my website. So if you go to professormesser.com slash pop quiz, they are effectively an archive of all of the questions that we've ever asked in the study groups. So these are not questions from elsewhere on the internet. They're not questions that I do on my daily, on my weekly pop quiz for Network Plus. These are just on my site. Um, there's quite a few Network Plus tests that are up there now, hundreds of questions. So feel free to have a look. If you're studying for your A plus or your Security Plus, there's questions there for those as well. That might be useful too. Some of you have asked for this study group to be available in a podcast form, and now that now it is. If you go to professormesser.com slash podcasts, you can either listen or download or subscribe or grab the RSS feed for your favorite podcast listening program. You can go to the Apple iTunes and search the iTunes store for Professor Messer and find those in there as well. There is a podcast for A+, there's a podcast for Network+, Plus, a podcast for Security+, Plus, and it's a replay of the study group and a replay of the after show of the study group because we stick around after the first uh, hour and I just answer questions for whatever. But let's talk about the questions today. I want to have you participate and this is how you do it. Go to Socrative.com and you on Socrative.com there's a button at the top that says student login. Click that student login and in the room name type in Professor Messer. All one word. Make sure you spell it right or you will be in a room by yourself. There's, there's no one else in there. So make sure you spell it right. You will see a question immediately when you go into this room. That's how you know it's working for you. And you don't have to go anywhere else. Once you're in the room, you just sit there and you'll be okay. There are also apps for this on the Google Play Store and the Apple App Store and the Windows Store. I think they even have a plug-in for Chrome, something that's useful to have there. Just make sure you get the student app, not the teacher app. I get the teacher app. You get the student app. Unless you'd like to have your own class someday, and then, of course, you get the teacher app. But that won't help you right now. You need to get the student app. Uh, and once you're in there, you will see a question. And the question to start us off with, did your team win? Oh, the question. What What are you talking about? Did my team win? Well, I have some, some uh, answers here that I've predefined, pre-configured for you. Did my team win? Uh, the answers are yes. Uh, yes, if you stop the game at halftime. I was rooting for the commercials. And then was there even a game? Some of you are answering that as well. You'll see that pop up on the screen. You can answer. And then as you can see in real time on this side, I can see what you're answering. I don't know what you are answering. So feel free to, to take a guess. You're not going to embarrass yourself because I have no idea who's really answering all of these. But I get, do get to see a summary of what everyone is answering. So that may be something to think about when you're going through those. Kind of nice to have that there. 
The N10-006 exam is one that has been around and since February. It's been around uh, for quite some time, February 2015. Uh, what we really expect is CompT update, updates these about every three years or so plus or minus. One of the things that you would expect then is for the Network Plus exam to be updated probably sometime at the beginning or sometime during 2018. I would not expect there to be any changes to the Network Plus exam until then. So if you're someone who is studying right now and you're wondering, should I wait for a new version of the exam? Uh, my first response to that is always never, never wait to get certified. Always go right away and get certified. Now, the, there might be a, a few differences if, you're, if your employer wants you to get the latest version and the latest version is coming in a month, well, maybe you might want to wait. But even when the new one is released, they still have six months or so of overlap. So you're never stopped right in the middle. You always have some time to either transition to the new version or continue with your studies so that you can get through that version ultimately uh, taking the exam gets you the Network Plus certification, regardless of what version you would ever take. So never, never wait to get certified. Never, never, never. So uh, that's that's good for us right now. As we're sitting here in February of 2017, we have plenty of time to study for Network Plus. So that's something useful anyway. Let's ask some questions. Let's get this started, shall we, and go through some of the questions that I have available. The first one I have for you, and something I like to do in my study groups now, is ask you a performance-based question. And for those of you not familiar with the Network Plus exam, most of the exam is multiple choice. And we will certainly have more multiple choice questions today. But at the very beginning of the exam, they hit you with a handful of what they call performance-based questions. These could be questions where you have, uh, instead of multiple choice, it might be fill in the blank. It might be a matching question. They might show you a picture of a network diagram and ask, ask you questions about that network diagram. You may have to change things that are in the network diagram. They might give you a command prompt and ask you to perform a function at the command prompt. So this is something that really gets gets you thinking about how to solve a problem. And you have to be very familiar with more than just what's in the book. You will have had to perform some of these tasks before so that you know how to apply it in these performance-based questions. So let's jump in the first performance-based question, which is effectively a fill in the blank. I am not going to give you any promptings with these. And do not answer in the chat room, by the way. That's our number one rule. Uh, in the study group is no talking in the chat room about the question. You should instead go to Socrative.com to the student login and go to the room professor messer to answer the question. This one is one where you're going to need to type it in. You're going to need to, to put your answers uh, right in there to show me what you think these connectors are. So this is one where maybe you're familiar with these, maybe you're not. Well, I think uh, many of you should probably be familiar with most of these, especially from a networking perspective. We deal with so many wires in networking. You've always seen online uh, the pictures of, of the cable messes. Uh, if you go to reddit.com, there is a subreddit for what they call cable porn. When somebody's taken a mess, a spaghetti wall of wire, and they've really made it look really great. It's, it's interesting to see the transformations that people can go through when they work with this. But because we're in networking, there's tons of wires. There's tons of cables. There's lots of connectors. And it's very important, especially for the exam, that you know what those connectors are. So make sure that you go through and look at this. So I think most of you do know what these are. I'm going to put up what your answers are as they're coming through. This is what I see on my side when it's a fill in the blank. So some of you are doing pretty well. So most of you are saying there's F connector, or coax, RJ45, DB9. Some say VGA is the third one. Uh, the last one's a little bit iffy. Many of you say B and C. Uh, some of you say maybe. Others are saying maybe it's optic fiber is the one that's purple. What is that? Uh, it's difficult to kind of see. I've got a better picture of this, too, I'll bring up. So maybe you can see it a little bit better on the screen right there. There might be something better to go through. This is one where on the exam, I could see them giving you pictures that you have to match to words. I don't think there's a lot of fill in the blank on the exam, but they could certainly ask you fill in the blank. That's something they do. If you watch the CompTIA video on taking a CompTIA exam, it's on YouTube. Just search for taking a CompTIA exam. They go through what all of these different options might be for performance-based questions. So let's see how we did with this one. I've got the answers right 
here. So the first one, as you can see on the screen, uh, the colors may have thrown you off too. But don't be thrown off by colors. Colors and cables mean nothing. Cables can be black. They can be purple. They can be blue. They can be red. They can be green. And a color doesn't necessarily associate a particular cable with a particular type of what's inside the cable. So the first one on the far left here, we've got an F connector. Do I have a highlighter? There we go. An F connector. F connectors are coax. They are what we traditionally think of for cable television. So when you're thinking about plugging in a cable modem, you're probably using an F connector to plug in that particular connection. You've got RJ45. That one's a pretty common one. That one looks very familiar, I think, to most of us. Since we're all using these very uh, common Ethernet connections, these eight pins. And if you look very closely, you can even count the number of wires inside of it and see that, yes, indeed, there's eight, eight connectors inside of that. Uh, eight positions and eight connectors. So you've got plenty of wires on the inside. The third one, a DB9. Now, technically speaking, that's a DE9, as some of you are mentioning uh, in the chat room. And you've mentioned it also in the messages that go by. But because the first type of serial connection that we generally used in the industry was a 25-pin DB-sized connector, that last letter is referring to the size of the connector. The DB connector was much bigger. When the nine pins came out, everyone just called it a DB9 even though technically it was an E-size connector. So I think if you, if you ever work with that, you'll be, uh, you'll be in pretty good shape in working with those pieces. I think whenever I start working through the challenges with the connectors, I really have to look very closely to see exactly what the type of connector is. This one almost looks like VGA. A number of you said that's a VGA connector, but it isn't. You have to look very closely at the number of pins. The challenge, of course, is that a VGA connector uses the same type of DE connection, but it's not a 9, it's a 15 pin. The number 9 refers to the number of pins or the number of holes that are here. So this it's difficult, I understand, to see. But if you, if you came up with uh, something close, you would know. Because this is the Network Plus, you're probably not going to be asked about a VGA connector. You're probably going to be asked about a DB9 connector because these are usually used for serial connections. If you are configuring a router, a firewall, a switch that has that type of DB connector on it, it's a serial DB9 that you're going to be working with. And the last one here is pretty purple cable. It's a BNC. So again, a coax cable is a different kind of connector on the end. And we're really asking about the connectors for these. And that one certainly is a BNC. It's kind of hard to see here. That uh, BNC is one that you plug in and then you twist and it locks in place. You can't pull it out unless you untwist it, which is great if you have one. But if you have a, a, a 20 of them in a row, they're actually uh, these tools. I should have brought one out. They're these tools that have these long handles on them where you can put it in there and twist it so you can pull out the BNC connectors. They're a little bit more of a challenge when you have a lot of them in a very tiny place. Imagine all of these coax connections coming in, all these BNCs. They're very tightly connected on these on these uh, devices. And the chat room people are saying British Naval Connector. It's not British Naval Connector. BNC is referring to the manufacturer name of the people who created the connector. So this is one where whenever you start getting into cable types, becomes a little bit more of a challenge. It's that bayonet is the type where you're plugging it and twisting. And that's the B in the bayonet. And the Neil Councilman is the, the two gentlemen who came up with the design for the connector itself. There is a, a lot that you might need to know. These are just a few of the cable types and connectors you need to know for Network Plus. I just put some copper ones on here. Maybe next month I'll do fiber. So if you are one who's trying to become more familiar with Network Plus, that'll give you a clue on some of the performance-based questions that we might try for next month. So make sure you're ready for the next study group. I think most of you got this one pretty well. Some of you didn't quite get a couple of them. So hopefully now you know what they are. And if they ever pop up on your exam, you're going to be in pretty good shape. Let's go to another question. I think I have one that's now more of a multiple choice question. Let's see if it is. The question is more of a challenge of uh, of performing a troubleshooting. Uh, this one is you're troubleshooting a problem with email passing through your firewall. Which of these port numbers would be important? This is obviously something that's very common for somebody who is working with firewalls. Because of course, it's always the network. Whenever there's a problem, it's always the network. It's always the mysterious thing behind the wall that we don't know anything about. So they, of course, are going to come to you first as your network administrator and ask you, what, your, what you think this problem is with the network. So they're going to tell you, obviously, if it's not the network, it's the firewall. And you, as the network person, have to be able to handle the firewall piece easy. So maybe you also know 
how this works as well. If you're working with a firewall and you're trying to determine is traffic passing or not, then you need to be able to understand what port numbers are going to be important. And the question here about email passing through your firewall, which of these port numbers would be important? Would it be TCP 25? Would it be TCP 139? Would it be TCP 443? TCP 1720 or UDP 2427? One of those is going to be the right one. If you think you know the answer, don't answer in the chat room. You want to go to Socrative.com and click the student login and go to the room that is named Professor Messer, which someone has nicely put into the chat room. If you're watching this live on YouTube, by the way, you'll notice there's not a chat room there. So I've got a live page that has the chat. And you can find that on my website, ProfessorMesser.com slash live, where you will find all of the live events that are there. Also, by the way, this is where I, I archive things for about a week. So until the next e live event, I like to leave the replay in there. And the replays for these are available immediately afterwards. So if you're someone who's looking for the replay, you know it was earlier in the day, you can always go to professormesser.com slash live. I will eventually archive it and put it in a formal post on my website. Sometimes I'm able to do that faster than other times. Uh, sometimes, actually most of the time, it's slower than, <laughs> than other times. So you can always go to slash live and see what the last one is. So the question here was really about ports. So let's see how we did. I'm going to click the How Do We Do button. And we got a little bit of everything here. Well, at least one big thing. TCP 25 is 68%, although TCP 443 is 24%. Uh, TCP 139 is 7%. And then hardly anybody chose 1720 or 2427. I wonder why. Well, let's talk about email. It becomes to be pretty important. You have to know a certain set of port numbers for your Network Plus exam. Obviously, there are hundreds and hundreds and thousands, actually, of port numbers that you would need to know whenever we're working through those things. So make sure that you're able to get through this and understand what all of the ones you should know for the exam. They are all in the exam objectives. There's no reason to learn port numbers that aren't listed in the exam objectives. There's a finite number. And those are the ones that I have in my study group. Those are the ones that I have on my course notes. They are the ones in my videos. I stick with the exam objectives. If you stick to the exam objectives, you'll be in good shape as well. So here are a list of port numbers that are very specific to email. And as we can see, POP3, very, very uh, popular email post office protocol, version 3, uses TCP 110. Another, probably the most popular email protocol these days is IMAP 4 for people that are retrieving email from servers. That is uses TCP 143. And between email servers, SMTP is a very common protocol. And that uses TCP 25. So those are the three probably most important ones that we need to know about. So obviously, we need to look at our list and see, does TCP 110, 143, or 25 match? And we see we got about 68% of you that did choose TCP 25, did not see any of the other email protocols listed in here. These are certainly protocols and port numbers that you should know, because all of these I did pull from the exam objectives. So if you're looking at any of these, and you're wondering, what is that protocol? What is that port number referred to? Go back and check your exam objectives. Make sure you check your notes, because you need to know all of the port numbers that are listed as answers for this question. But obviously, TCP port, port 25 is the only one listed here that would be the important one that we need to do. Now, this can be a, a challenge if you've never taken a CompTIA exam before. They might put in, the, um, in, this, in this question, which of these would be the best port number to consider? They might ask you, which of these would be the most appropriate port number? And they might give you a lot of different port numbers. Because the challenge could be TCP port 443, for example, is HTTPS. And that's one of the answers here. And I use Google Mail, and that uses HTTPS. Therefore, that's the import mail protocol. But in this particular case, we're really talking about email passing through the firewall. It's very specific to email. Port 443 is not an email protocol. We're really looking at encrypted HTTP uh, and dealing with the HTTPS protocol in general. That's, that's something that's beyond the scope of email. That's a much broader communications protocol. When we're talking about email. We have to find the best answer. And that's something to tell you at the beginning of the exam, always answer the best answer for any of these multiple choice questions. So TCP port 25 really is the best answer because that's the only email specific protocol that is in this list. And if you answered A, TCP port 25, 
You got this one absolutely right. Let's do another one. This is one where we have to now think about how our network operates. And I think for the exam, this is an important thing to know as well. The question is, which of these would be the best way to prevent loops on a switched network? And I gave you a list of things. Which of these would be the best way to prevent loops on a switched network? There's many ways you can loop a network. So make sure you're reading through all of the questions, and more importantly, reading through all of the answers and understanding what these are. The possible answers are split horizon, RSTP, static routing, RTP, and 802.1Q. One of these would be the best way. Now, again, they, they always put that in there, the best way to prevent loops on a switched network. Maybe you know what this one is. I'll see some of you in the chat room do know what it is. And if you think you know what it is, don't answer in the chat room. You want to go to Socrative.com to the room name Professor Messer. Click that student login, and you can go to room name Professor Messer. This is one where you do have to understand looping on a network. It's a, it's a lot of a, it's a big problem. We can have loops on switch networks. We can have loops on routed networks. We can have loops with routing protocols. There are a lot of different problems with looping when you get into networking because we have all these cables. You know, things can start to loop around. But there's different ways that we can mitigate a looping problem. So maybe this is something that you can work with to try to figure out where the problems might be and how you can fix them. One of the things, though, is I put a lot of different technologies on the screen. I put a lot of different things. And, and some of these answers deal a lot with uh, loops, but not specific to the loops we're talking about. So you have to understand what is looping and how to resolve it at different layers of the OSI model effectively. Let's see how we did with this one. Well, you can see we're, we're a little bit torn. Well, if we look at the, the one that really did get the highest, it's certainly far from being a majority. The 33% of you said RSTP. So that's certainly a good one to see. RSTP is in the lead by about 10 points because we kind of have a tie for second. Uh, let's see, 25% said split horizon. 23% said static routing. So all of these things certainly bring to mind looping. So I can't say necessarily you're on the wrong track. Now, if you get down into these others, however, in answer E, 802.1Q has nothing to do with looping. That's 11% of you. Unfortunately, that would not be the right answer. And 5% of you said RTP, not looping there either. So really, we have the choice between these top three. In the chat room, they're mentioning this. They're talking about, yeah, there's a, there's a process of elimination we can go through and work through with these. So maybe you know what the answers are in figuring out these as well. Let's look at looping and why it's important uh, to deal with when you talk about looping and all of these pieces. Let's, let's break this down. So the one you should really know about when you're talking about anything dealing with looping on a switch network, so, uh, looping at layer two, looping when you're, you're bridging or switching. When you hear looping and switching, looping and bridging, anything along those lines of looping at layer two, you're talking about the need to have a spanning tree protocol enabled. Spanning tree is the one protocol for switches that will allow you to prevent a loop. That's because with Ethernet, and we're not really talking about IP, but right there at the MAC address level, at layer two of the OSI model, there's no way to count how many times a particular frame passes by you. And if it starts looping around, it could loop forever until you fix the loop until you correct the looping problem. Obviously, you can see as more people get on the network and everything start looping, you can quickly, in a matter of seconds, bring down an enterprise network by creating a loop on the network. And this has happened to everyone. It has happened to me. It's happened to every network professional I know. You're going to loop the network eventually. You need to understand how to fix it. Most of the time, you just unplug where the loop is. And, and you're in good shape to be able to figure out where that loop is. But what if there was a way that your switches could automatically determine that a loop was there and automatically break the loop? Well, that's what Spanning Tree Protocol does. The one that I listed, I noticed I didn't put Spanning Tree Protocol or STP. I put RSTP as the questions. That is probably the most the, the most modern and the one you're going to find the most being implemented on switches, which is RSTP, which is rapid spanning tree protocol. 
Uh, this one where uh, the reason we use this rapid and the reason the rapid's there is because spanning tree protocol in its original form took quite a while. We're talking 15, 30, sometimes longer, 45 and 60 seconds to converge the network, as we call it, which is to get everything back into a working state. The convergence on RSTP is down to six seconds. And that's what you want. You want the network to be available. So RSTP will find the problem, get rid of the loop, and get everything back to normal in six seconds. Many applications won't even know anything happened in six seconds. Obviously, if you're on the phone with voice over IP, you will know if you lose six seconds of time. But uh, some applications, like the web-based applications, are really easy to use that way. This is also backwards compatible with uh, the original uh, spanning true protocol, 802.1D. So you can really put RSTP really anywhere. And it's very easy to implement. It's almost it's almost exactly the same process. There's a little bit of difference between these two protocols and the way they operate. But it's a very, very fast way to, to resolve this problem. If you did not have spanning tree, people are asking in the chat room, well, how do you fix the problem? If you don't know, if you've looped the network and you don't have spanning tree, you've got to track back. First, find out if anybody's in a closet. That's the first thing you have to do. Who touched the network last? What did you touch? What did you type in to the switch to make this happen? And very often, we all begin disconnecting cables. Where are the switches connecting to each other? Let's disconnect every place where switches are connected to each other. Uh, it's very easy to plug things in. As you're plugging in new devices, it's very easy to accidentally loop a cable. And if you're doing that in the middle of the day, that can be very bad. So the way that you correct the loop is you disconnect it. You unplug it. And you no longer have a loop on the network to have that there. So if we look at our answers. Well, split horizon is very useful for preventing loops on a routed network. So that would not be a switch network. I specifically mentioned switch network here for that reason, to have that there. Our um, static routing is one that might help you prevent loops on a routed network. Again, routing is different than switching. We're really focusing on switching for this question. RTP, the real-time protocol used for voice over IP communication, has nothing to do with loops. Uh, and 802.1Q is the protocol that's used to trunk VLANs between switches. That would not really have anything to do with looping either. The rapid STP is the one that we are looking for. If you answered B, 36% of you got that one absolutely correct. Some of you in the chat room say, how do you even implement RSTP? As you get into switch configurations, that's certainly something if you move uh, past Network Plus, you get into doing some type of switch administration. It's part of the configuration of the switch itself. You would enable RSTP on the switch, associate it with the interfaces that are on the switch, and it takes care of everything from there. Just turn it on, click the button, type it in to enable it, and you're good to go. A lot of switches enable it by default. So it is going to perform spanning tree by default. Some require that you enable it manually. So you have to check your switch and your manufacturer to know exactly how to implement that. But pretty important on a switch network, if you're not running spanning tree, you're just setting yourself up for a problem. A lot of people think, oh, it's a pain because I connect to the network and there's a delay as it tries to figure out if there's a loop or not and then allows you on to the network. That's six seconds of my life. Uh, but it, it, it's surprising how many people don't implement it. A lot of people in the chat room, why wouldn't you turn it on? I don't know. Some people just don't like it, I guess. But uh, you're going to really like it if somebody tries to loop the network. That's going to be a, a bit of a challenge. There is so much on the Network Plus exam. It is huge. It is a big certification. It probably, as some people have said, have the most number of acronyms than any other CompTIA exam. I can't say you're wrong with that one. There are tons of acronyms on Network Plus. We're so, we love our acronyms with networking. And if you're someone who's trying to wade through this uh, morass of abbreviations and technologies and trying to understand more about how this is all going to fit together, you might want to go through every single one of my videos and take very copious notes. However, you may not have time for that. And of course, I have a lot of great graphics in my videos. Those are hard to take notes on and other things as well. So what I did is I took all of my videos, went video by video, and I made notes for you. And these course notes are available for Network Plus right now. You can download them immediately in PDF form and put them on all of your devices so that you're able to, wherever you are, Reference the notes. See what you need to know. This doesn't replace your book. It doesn't replace the videos. But it does replace you having to make notes for yourself or at least get you really along the way of making these notes because we're talking about 15 pages 
of notes for Network Plus. These are the Network Plus course notes. I'm just going to flip through and scroll through a few pages worth of this content. So every graphic, every table, all the important text. There's our images of the cable types and the connectors. There's the DB25 and the DB, DB9 connector that we just talked about. They're all in here. So I tried to fit into the course notes as much as I could so that you would have the best possible chance to pass this information on the exam. It becomes something that maybe you like to have that last bit of information to cram on before you walk into the exam. This would be a great place to do it. Plus, every dollar you spend here goes right back to keeping the website up and running. And that's something some people will do. I don't accept donations to keep the site going. I'd rather give you something in return for your money. And this is just another way that you can help keep the site running. At the same time, I can give you something in return. My thanks for helping us continue this crazy experiment that we continue to, to build on every day. So I want to thank you for that as well. To find out more about these course notes, you can find out uh, on the website, professormesser.com slash NPCN Network Plus Course Notes, NPCN. Be something useful you might be able to try. It's only $10. You can download it immediately and have all of these notes in your machine, on all of your devices, and your studying. So thanks so much. Let's get back to our questions. I have another one for you. Each of these technologies, well, excuse me, which of these technologies would be the best option to secure a public Ethernet drop in a conference room? So we're effectively now given something that we need to solve a problem. We've got a conference room. We've got a public Ethernet drop. Which of these technologies would be the best option to secure that? I have some options for you. One of those is VLAN assignments. One is DHCP snooping. Perhaps it's Mac filtering. Could it be dynamic ARP inspection? Or might it be 802.1D? One of these would be the best option to secure a public Ethernet drop in a conference room. Maybe you know what this is. This is one you, you could really, uh, I've used these all the time. I go into to a, a conference room. I have a meeting. They, are, they hand me a connection, say, here's a public connection. Anybody who walks in is able to use this, and we're able to to take advantage of an internet connection because very often we're connecting out to perform demos or show a presentation. So it's nice to have those there, but security is always an issue. Now, if you think you know how to resolve this problem, how to fix this conference room so it's secure, so you just go to Socrative.com to the student login and go to room name Professor Messer. Maybe you know how to resolve this particular issue. This is another question, by the way, that's very common on the Network Plus exam, which is not just an explanation asking you for a definition. They're not asking you to tell me what the acronym is. There's almost no questions like that on the exam where you have they give you an acronym, you have to say what it is or determine what it is. They're really trying to help, hopefully have you understand what the acronym really means, how you would implement this in a practical situation. So even though this would not be considered a performance-based question, this is certainly the kind of question on an exam where you have to think about a problem and then be able to solve it. This also, by the way, is something you do every day as a network administrator. People will say, hi, we've got a new conference room. We need a public drop in there because because uh, Professor Messer is coming into a presentation, needs an internet connection. How can we put an internet connection in there for him on this ethernet drop, but still maintain security? Hmm, good question. How would we do that? And here's your answers. So maybe, maybe you know what the answer is and be able to do that and work through them. Let's see how we did with this one. We have a look at the answers and how people answered these. Well, 50%, right in the middle which, by the way, is where I shoot for whenever I create these questions. I want half of you to get these questions right and half of you to not get the question right. So we hit 50%, but is it really the right answer? Is it really the question? 50% uh, of you said VLAN assignments. 32% of you, 33, said Mac filtering. Certainly a valid security technology. And then we have single digits for dynamic ARP inspection, DHCP snooping, and 802.1D. So one of those challenges we have is to figure out how to resolve this issue. And this is something you will probably run into very often. If you are working in a company, you go into a conference room, you're part of the company, you still need to you have this Ethernet cable on the table. You need to give your guests access to the Internet, but you also need to keep your guests out of your corporate network. And the way you do that most commonly is with VLAN assignments. 
the way that this would be set up is that that Ethernet connection in the conference room is on what you might consider an unsecured VLAN or a public VLAN. You would build out a new VLAN in your switch and you'd say, this is a public VLAN and you would set up either access control lists or connect this particular VLAN to a firewall that would prevent any traffic going between this VLAN and any of your internal networks. This is one that's more of a, a DMZ type network, one that you would sit on the outside of the network or at least in the middle between the big bad internet and the very private corporate enterprise network on the inside. But of course, if I'm going into the conference room, I'm part of the company. I'm someone who works here all the time. I need to get into the private network that's inside the company. Even though I'm sitting in the conference room, how would I do that? Very commonly, people will open up a VPN client just as if they were sitting at home and trying to get to their corporate network. They pop open their VPN client in the conference room and VPN to the corporate network from there. That way, all of that communication is encrypted, it's secure, you've authenticated onto that VPN, and yet we still have an Ethernet drop that's available for our guests to use. They can't get into the corporate network because they don't have VPN credentials, but they can get out to the internet, which is a great way to do this. So that way you keep the guests away from your servers, you keep the guests away from your load balancers, you get the guests away from your database servers, you keep them completely away from the corporate network. And just do that by separating things out by VLAN and putting some type of controls in place to prevent any traffic from that VLAN to any other part of the network. So if we look at the responses, indeed, that 50% of you, 52% now, said VLAN assignments. That would be probably the best option available in this list of options. Could there be other options that might be better? There might be. There could be, uh, we put a firewall in the conference room and we connect everybody to the firewall or connect the conference room to directly to a firewall. That might be a better answer than a, a VPN. That wasn't one of our options available. That's one of the things you have to get used to on the exam is they might ask you a question and you I know exactly how to solve that problem and how you would solve it is not listed in the answers that are here. They give you a finite set of answers. They really want you to think about this problem. And sometimes the most obvious and clear cut answer isn't one that's available to you, which by the way, is that's pretty much how it works in the real world, isn't it? We think we know exactly how to solve it. Go, oh, you can't do that here. You gotta do something else. Same problem with these particular answers too. A Mac filtering would be an excellent solution if you were able to first administer it on a network like this, uh, conference rooms are horrible with being able to figure out how to filter out MAC addresses, who is a public MAC address. And by the way, MAC filtering is easily spoofable. So let's say you filled up a MAC filter on a conference room uh, drop, and that MAC filter allowed people that were in the company to, to get inside, to traverse into the inside of the network. All I have to do is sniff around, find a MAC address of, a, of someone who works there, and then put that MAC address in my machine, and now I have access to the internal network. Mac, MAC filtering is not a security uh, technique, not a security control. It's something that is really more administrative, and quite honestly, it's just not useful for much, really. So that would not be the right answer either. Um, and we don't often see MAC filtering on an Ethernet drop either. That's another clue for you. Generally, MAC filtering is something you commonly see on a wireless network. It could certainly be applied to a wired network, but it's just not common to see that there. So that should make you think for a moment like, hmm, I don't know if that's really what I might want to do there. Let's see if 6% uh, DHCP snooping and dynamic ARP inspection, that would at least prevent somebody from putting their own DHCP server on the network. And it would prevent somebody, for instance, from trying to perform a man in the middle at the ARP level. That's not something you would do in this case. Either 802.1D, we just talked about spanning tree, has nothing to do with security on a public Ethernet drop in a conference room. That means if you answered a VLAN assignments, you got this one absolutely correct. And that means also that that's our super secret code word of the month. If you're watching this or listening to this for continuing education credit, I will give you one hour of webinar continuing education credits by performing these specific functions. You have to follow this particular process or I don't give you the credit. You have to go to the top or the bottom of the Professor Messer website. There's a link there called Contact Us. 
that really contact me. That's where it goes. That contact us link will bring you to a form that will ask you for your name, your email address, and then there's a notes box there. In that notes box, you want to make sure you put your, of course, put your name and your email address, make sure they're correct on that form. And then you want to put that this is the February 2017 Network Plus study group. And somewhere in that note, you want to put the words VLAN assignments. That is the code word for this month, VLAN assignments. And you have to follow that process to be able to earn that continuing education unit. And I'll be glad to send that to you. Usually it takes me about a week to turn these around. So if you're not getting a response immediately, don't worry. I will get to these eventually and get back to you with the CEU. I'm the one reading these. So if you want to put anything else in the note, you want to put any comments in there, you're welcome to do so. Be able to do that. And that way, you'll be able to earn CEUs for just hanging out and answering questions with me. What could be easier than that? Let's go to another question. Oh, by the way, on this last one, if you did answer A, VLAN assignments, that is the correct answer. 53% of you got that one right. Let's continue on. I have another question for you. This one deals, since we're talking about, we just talked about MAC filtering, so let's talk about MAC addresses. Which of these? would be the best way. Oh, now I've got the wrong question up for you. There we go. Here's the right question. Which of these would be the best way to view the MAC address of your default gateway? Maybe you know which one this is. Which of these would be the best way to view the MAC address of your default gateway? And I've got some options for you. Would it be, would it be a ping? Would it be an ARP? Would it be a traceroute? Would it be a netstat? Would it be a path ping? One of these would be the best way to view the MAC address of your default gateway. I'm noticing on my side, some of you saw another question come up. Hopefully, you saw it also flip to this latest question. This should be the one number seven, which is which of these would be the best way to view the MAC address of your default gateway. And I'm noticing on my slide, on my slide, on my side, <laughs> my slides, I'm seeing that I don't have the right ones up here either. That's okay. I can fix it on my side. One of these also, by the way, are important to know. So you'll notice every answer here is a command line answer. It's a com something you would type at the command line to figure this out. Um, it's something you absolutely know when you're working through these exams. There's a list of commands you need to know. Make sure you've used them. Make sure you've tried them out. In my videos, I demonstrate them. And you can follow along with my demonstrations. But I highly recommend that you try a few things yourself. Try your own connections. Ch uh, perform your own ping and your own ARP and your own trace route and your own net stout and your own path ping so you can figure out what's there. Comes very useful. Yes, notice there are some answers here that may have been obvious that aren't listed here. As I mentioned earlier, a CompTIA loves to do this. There may be one that you go that is your go-to command for viewing the MAC address of your default gateway. And your go-to command may not actually be here. So it makes you think that, hmm, there must be a different command I would use for this. Maybe it is. If you think you know the answer, go to this particular view, being able to work through these pieces. Maybe you, maybe you know what they are on here. So I need to, need to fix a few things. We're going to make sure we get that in my view, being able to work through all these pieces. Some of you are asking questions about that first question. If you answer a serial connection instead of a DB9 or a DE9, would CompTIA consider that correct? I don't think CompTIA does a lot of fill in the blanks on their, on their, on their exams. Uh, based on what I have seen, based on what I understand uh, on, the, on these devices and having that there, um, that's something that does, uh, does become a little bit more of a challenge knowing that. But I think most of the time it's a matching, so you should be able to match it up pretty well. Don't worry about that too much. Uh, some of you are having issues with the CAPTCHA on the Contact Us page, as you're saying. First, CAPTCHA is awful to begin with. So yes, I agree. There are some. In fact, the, the Contact Us page is one I need to make sure is updated so the CAPTCHAs work. I'll check on that after this is over. But keep trying. It may just be one of those things like I go through, like I'm sure I typed it in properly. And yet it tells me I didn't. So you may want to give it a couple of chances there to be able to work through the answers. Let's see how we did with this question. Issues, uh, let's see, which of these would be the best way? How do we do? Well, again, we're a little torn. 46% of us said ARP. That would be the way that we would view the MAC address of your default gateway. 31% said NetStat. That's a pretty good, healthy number. And then it drops down to 14% for traceroute and 8% for a ping. And only 1% said path ping. 
Pathping is on the exam for Network Plus, and I have no idea. I'm not sure anyone has ever used Pathping before. It's a neat little utility, and I can see where it may come in handy to do certain things. I just never seen anyone use it. Maybe it's we aren't patient enough. Pathping takes a little bit of time to run, and we're never patient enough. Could that be the right answer? I don't know. Let's talk about the right answer. And some of you in the chat room were kind of on the right track with this one. This is one wherever you work through them. The, the one thing that really should be your clue with this one is the address resolution protocol, because that is the protocol that is able to look for an IP address, find out what the MAC address is of that IP address, and then provide that information back to your machine. Because you don't actually communicate with devices at, at the most basic level on the network through an IP address. At the most basic level on the network, on an Ethernet network, you're communicating through a MAC address. So that ARP happens all the time. You're going to be ARPing to all the devices on your local network to find out what the MAC addresses are of these devices. And some of you in the chat room said, well, what about IP config and if config? Those would be something that might show you the MAC address on your machine. But the question was that I wanted to know the MAC address on the default gateway. It's not on your machine. All right, that becomes a little more of a challenge. How do I find that then? Uh, fortunately, there is that great ARP command that will list out the local ARP cache that's on your machine. So if you've ever communicated to any other device on your local network, you've had to request its MAC address with the ARP protocol behind the scenes. It asks, hey, does anybody know uh, if you happen to be this IP address of my default gateway, could you respond back to me with your MAC address, please? That is a broadcast sent out that your default gateway will see and go, well, of course, I will send you my MAC address. Here is the response to your request, your ARP request. This is my MAC address. So for your machine to instead not do that every time it has to send a frame out on the network, it instead caches that information and holds it in, into a, a cache for a certain amount of time. So that's one that becomes handy. And it allows you to see all of the MAC addresses that you happen to know at any particular time by using the ARP command. How we'll do this most of the time in the field is we would ping a device like our default gateway. That will begin, if we haven't ARP to it before, well, I will certainly begin the ARP process. We'll get a response back. If the ping works, we know that the ARP must have occurred. If the, if the ping doesn't work, our next question might be, well, did I at least get a MAC address? of the device. Maybe it's not responding to me for another reason. Did I at least communicate with it at an ARP level? And if you perform an ARP dash A, uh, you'll be able to see your list of cache. You go, well, there it is. It did respond to me. Or it's not in the list. It didn't even respond. I wonder if I even have the right IP address for this device. A little bit of, more of a challenge being able to work through that. There's lots of ways to find a MAC address of a device. This is the easiest way, especially given the options that we had available. So ping would show you an IP address of your remote device, in this case, your default gateway. But it would not show you a MAC address. The trace route won't show you a MAC address either. Netstat generally doesn't show MAC addresses, although I can probably bet that there is a Netstat option in there somewhere that probably shows MAC addresses. Netstat is a very busy app, but probably not the best way to find a very specific MAC address of a very specific device, especially if you are not communicating to that device. Netstat isn't going to help you very much. And PathPing is a great little utility that will perform effectively a ping and a trace route. It does it over time and then gives you an evaluation of how it believes the health of this particular connection between those IP addresses happens to be. It's a little bit more involved. I've got a video on all of these. So you can go to my video on command lines and see exactly how to perform these particular functions across the board for all of these. In this particular case, ARP indeed would be our best possible answer. The 48% of you that answered ARP got that one right. Well done on all of those. Now, if you're someone who doesn't have access to these labs, you're not someone who has worked a lot with these utilities, you might need more time to work 
at uh, a basic level on these systems, being able to set up networks, being able to work on access control lists, to be able to work on a firewall and work through some of the, the port numbers that we talked about earlier might help you with that what I call muscle memory. It's when I've done this before, I know exactly the process, I'll type some things in, and then I'll be able to remember that better whenever I'm asked about it on my exam. And in fact, there's a great set of labs from GTS Learning that can do exactly that. I've got the labs up on my screen where I can, for instance, understand network protocols, ARP and ICMP. It's the very first one, but they have a list of many, many, many different labs. I'm going to keep scrolling. Network-based anti-malware, IPsec, threats and vulnerabilities, network load balancing, IPv4 and IPv6 addressing, system bottlenecks, IP utilities. That would probably be the one right in here would be the ARP command. That's the one where we would troubleshoot. Let's uh, let's click on that. We'll start this particular uh, lab that we happen to have here. And it brings us up in the lab. This particular lab has a bunch of machines on it. You can see there are five different devices. I've got a list of these devices here, and I can go through and power each one of them up. So this is almost like I had five machines sitting at my lab at home, or at five separate VMs that I could start up simultaneously, hopefully without bringing down my system. Running five VMs on your desktop, probably not something that's that advisable. But all the labs are here, and it steps you through a step-by-step -step how to use IP config. I wonder if I can step through quickly. Using ARP, exercise six. six. Uh, using ARP, viewing the ARP cache, it go, tells you to go to a particular Windows machine, type ARP-A, and then it tells you to perform some functions here and look at the different configurations and see which ones are there. Uh, how to add a static ARP cache, that's step two in the lab. So you really get an understanding of what ARP is. It explains to you what you're seeing on the screen, helps you really break down the different options. Here I've got domain controllers to work with, I've got Windows machines to work with, and they're all right here on the screen available. These are not emulated machines. These are full-blown virtual machines. So I can do anything in here. I can go well off lab if I wanted to. It not only works like Windows, it is Windows. So if you ever wanted to go in and try some different things and not have to worry about breaking your machine, this is another way to do it. Just a great set of labs to have something available. And I've got special pricing for you as well if you follow this link. If you go to professormesser.com slash netlabs, this will take you over to the GTS Learning site where you get special pricing for the net labs. That's something that you don't get if you go directly to the GTS Learning site. They're special right now, $109. They include their ebook. So not only are you getting labs, you're getting the GTS Learning ebook that I used to create my videos with. Uh, they also have, I think, 200 sample questions out there for Network Plus. You always need more sample questions. What a great place to go to get them from the folks at GTS Learning who've been doing this forever. And they're great folks to work with. You can find out all about these labs and uh, talk to the people at GTS Learning, see what they have available by following this link. This is how you get the special price, professormesser.com slash netlabs. Might be something you can go through and work with all of your labs. I think that's something that I use all the time. Maybe you'll like it as well. I want to thank also the folks at GTS Learning for helping to support what we do here at Messer Studios as well. Let's get back to some questions. I have more questions to go through. Bring up my Socrative. We're going to back up one question. Now, I think I can do this. Let's go to my previous question. There we go. And the previous question is right here that asks, which of these would be the best way to use OSPF learned routes in your RIP v2 routing updates? What would be the best way to use OSPF learned routes in your RIP v2 routing updates? We're getting heavy, heavy, heavy into routing, aren't we? So now we got a routing question. Now I have some options for you. Don't have to fill in the blank with this one. Maybe you know this. So the answers, the possible answers are A, route aggregation. B, route poisoning, C is split horizon, D is route redistribution, and E is route summarization. One of these is going to be the best way to learn OSPF learn routes in your RIP v2 routing updates. For those of you in the chat room still asking about the, uh, the NetLabs over at GTS Learning, it's $109. I think it's 12 months access. I think they give you access for a year for that $109. It is not $109 a month. No. Nope, that would be a thing, wouldn't it? It would, it would not be $109 a month. But it is online. It's all available. It's in there's a, there's a data center somewhere with this stuff humming, just waiting for you to connect to it. So that is uh, something they make available for you for 12 months. 
and do that. Um, and there's some significant di discounts uh, by going through that link instead of the GTS Learning website for those pieces. Now we're talking about routing, though. Now, if you've never worked with routing before, this, this might be a tough one. But it is a, an important topic from the CompTIA Network Plus exam. So one of those is a pretty important thing to do. Um, if this is one also you, you've never done routing before, all of these answers are routing technologies. They're all things you need to know about routing. But only one of these is really going to be the best way to answer this particular question. If you think you know what the answer is, you can go uh, to Socrative.com to the student login, go to room name Professor Messer. Yeah, some of you in the chat room even saying there's other ways to do some of the networking things like Packet Tracer and uh, GNS3. Certainly, if you're going to Cisco, certainly I think those would be good things to consider. And there are pluses and minuses with both of those as well. But they are something that doesn't work too well in Network Plus, however. Pretty outside the scope for Network Plus. Uh, it's something you, you really want to stick with something specific to the exam objectives. Whether you use these net labs for GTS learning or you build it yourself, Follow the exam objectives, and you'll be great. So let's talk about, let's see how we did with this particular answer. I'm going to click the how do we do. And again, we're a little bit torn, a little bit torn on this one. Let's try uh, look through what our answers are. 45% of you said route aggregation. So almost 50% in that list. Coming in second, uh, pretty far back at 26% route redistribution. 18% said route summarization. 11% said split horizon. Only 1% said route poisoning. So that's one that, that comes in a little bit more of a challenge there. Nobody really thought it was route poisoning. So how would I take routes and a router that had been learned through OSPF, uh, its own routing protocol with its own way of doing things, how do you get those routes to be used in a completely different routing protocol that has its own way of doing things, in this case, RIP v2. Well, the way that you do it is through a technology called, if I click on things on my screen, here we go, route redistribution. And that is really one of the fundamental functions of routing because in your environment, you will probably be using more than one type of routing. You may be doing probably maybe three types uh, is where most people, I think, generally are. There's probably a little bit of static routing. There's probably an internal routing protocol that you're going to use, uh, something like EIGRP, uh, probably not RIP v2. And you're probably going to be using maybe OSPF is what you use internally. And then there'll be an external protocol you use for communication to the internet. That's sometimes a BGP. Sometimes it's static routing. But you can see there's a mix of different routing mechanisms that you would see in an enterprise. Well, the problem is that on, on the, the face of them, by, by themselves, by default, none of those talk to each other. You have to have somehow tell the router to take routes learned through one mechanism, through one set of protocols, and convert them around to be able to use them with a different set of protocols, effectively redistribute them through these different protocols. This is what you would really focus on if you do have these. So if you want to take RIP v2 and put them into OSPF, or take OSPF routes and put them into BGP, or take a static route or a default route and redistribute it through RIP v2, it's using RIP redistribution to be able to do that. This is something that really is, is an important part. Once you get into really detailed routing and trying to work with firewalls, layer 3 firewalls, you're working with routers, you're working with layer 3 switches, this is, is, a, is a really challenge to your brain to be able to implement this properly. But this can be very valuable when you're running these different routing protocols. So if we look at the responses, the answers that we had, you can see route redistribution is the correct answer. D, only 25% said route redistribution. The 46% of you said route aggregation is a way that you can summarize routes into a single route list instead of having multiple routes listed in your routing table. Uh, route aggregation, by the way, is exactly the same thing as route summarization. So I actually put the same answer on here twice, but use different names. So uh, collectively, almost uh, over 60% of you said route aggregation and route summarization, which happens to be exactly the same words for the same thing, different words for the same thing. Uh, route redistribution, obviously, is the correct answer. Split horizon and route poisoning are technologies used inside of the routing protocols themselves. And almost every routing protocol has a way to poison the route so that if a route goes away, 
routers tell all the other routers, hey, I just saw this route go away. I just thought you'd like to know about it. So it sends out a message poisoning all of the other routers saying, don't send it because I don't know where it went. It went away. You don't need to have it in your routing table anymore. And then under Split Horizon, that's a way for routers to prevent creating loops within the routes so that routers don't advertise out of an interface routes that it learned from that interface to begin with. Why are you telling the people that just told you what the routes were? They already know that, so don't tell them. And that's what Split Horizon does. It's kind of a weird way to think about how that works, but Split Horizon comes in very handy. We were talking about Split Horizon in our chat room this week. We are talking about VPNs and being able to manage where traffic went with a VPN. Do you send all traffic over the VPN? Do you send some traffic over the VPN? And you can manage your Split Horizon in certain ways to allow that to occur or not allow that to occur. So that kind of summarizes very nicely uh, that the 25% the of you that chose route redistribution did a pretty good job with that one. Well done. Well, before we leave, let me remind you that one of the best things you can do, and I've already mentioned it, I don't know, 20 times today, is to get a copy of the exam objectives. I try to say this every month because every month people tell me they don't have it there. They don't, they don't know where it is. They've never looked at it. Uh, they've taken the exam and they got questions they weren't expecting. And I asked them, did you, did you, that's in the exam objectives. Did you see that? And they go, I don't know what you're talking about. CompTIA tells you everything you need to know for the exam. So if, uh, that's a very common question to get. What topics do I really need to focus on? Go to Google, type CompTIA exam objectives, download the exam objectives for Network Plus. That, those are the topics you need to know. If you know everything that is in the exam objectives, you will pass your Network Plus exam. It is really that simple. It's very focused. CompTIA does not tend to go outside the scope of this. They certainly can. They don't tend to do that. If you know everything that's in the exam objectives, you're going to be doing very, very good, very good to, to be able to have that there. It's an important part of your study. Before you start studying, you should have already downloaded this and read through it. Before you go to take your exam, use this as your checklist to see if you know everything. So it's something you can use at the very beginning and the very end. All of your books are going to have that in there. Don't dismiss it. It's extremely important. I try to do a study group every month. So I do A plus study groups, network plus study groups, security plus study groups, and there is one every month. If you would like to participate in the next study group, I have one in March, scheduled for March the 8th, exactly one month from today. And it's usually on a Wednesday at 12 noon Eastern time. If you go to professormesser.com slash calendar, it tells you when all of my events are. And it also has a conversion chart there so you can start to see where this fits into your time zone because you may be in a different country trying to figure out, well, I don't know when 12 noon Easter time is. That's okay. I got you covered. Go to professormesser.com slash calendar and you'll have that there and available as well. So we've, can you believe we've come to the end of our first hour? If you're here and you'd like to stay around for the after show, please stick around. I just open up the phone lines and we can talk about anything. It doesn't have to be Network Plus. Uh, but of course, we have a lot of things going on. Every week, I send out a Network Plus question of the week. You can find that on my Twitter feed at professormesser.com slash Twitter. Uh, you can see all the stuff we're doing on YouTube. I didn't mention it this month, but I put a new video out. I mentioned this last month, my seven-second subnetting. If you're somebody who's trying to struggle with subnetting, I've come up with a way that you can sit down for your exam, and there's just no math involved. You can subnet anything given to you in seven seconds with practically zero math. You'll see it's in my seven second subnetting video that you can find on professormesser.com slash YouTube. There's also, don't forget about my course notes. That might be something you can use and something you can help support the site with at professormesser.com slash NPCN. My thanks again to GTS Learning and their net labs at professormesser.com slash net labs. And of course, I do one of these practically every week. Next week will be Security Plus. You might want to hang out there and check that out for the Security Plus study group a week from today. And of course, you can find all of those at professormesser.com slash calendar. Well, I want to thank everyone for joining us. Thank you for sticking through the questions. We would not be able to do this without you. Thanks for your continuing support of watching the videos and buying the course notes and all of the things associated with the website. Helps keep everything running. And for that, I am eternally grateful. If you're here live, stick around for the second hour. If you have to drop off, I understand that as well. But I want you to thank you for joining us on this one. We will see you next time on the Network Plus Study Group. 
Oh, hello, chat room. I kind of messed everybody up there at the end with the seven-second subnetting thing, isn't it? Yes, no math. Well, there's a plus one and a minus one you have to do. That's really no math. There's no binary. There's no powers of two. None of those things. So it is the method that I use when I sit down for an exam that requires that I do subnetting because I am awful with subnetting. I've been doing this forever. I've been doing this since we started using IP on Novell Networks. This is a long time. And I still get subnetting wrong. So whenever I sat down for the exams, I had to come up with a way that I could subnet very, 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 very quickly. But it needed to be correct, and it needed to be fast, and it needed to be something I just didn't even think about. There's already too much stress on an exam. So it was a very, very good way to quickly perform the subnetting, and I was just solid. I didn't have to double check it. I knew it was absolutely correct when I did it. Uh, if I did need to double check, I only took another seven seconds, and I could double check. Uh, no, I don't agree that, that, that memorizing the powers of two is a good idea because I can't do it. That's why I sit down for an exam and I can't handle the stress. So that's, it's a seven second subnetting video. Go to professormaster.com slash YouTube and you will see that. All right, let's, uh, let's get the phone lines open. Uh, ba, 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 ba. no, you should not always remember two to the N minus two. This is my point. I can't do two to the N minus two. Can't do it. I get it wrong every single time. Or, although, if you do remember, if you're really good at that, right on. Good for you. I'm not that guy. I'm, and I say this in the video. There's lots of ways to change my seven-second subnetting process so it works for you. And please do that. I'm not the guy to remember that. It's not me. I can't handle it. Can't handle the stress, man. Cannot do it. So this is the after show for those of you that are that are listening in on the podcast. Uh, this is where I just open up the phone lines. I'll answer questions from the chat room. I'll answer questions from uh, the phone lines. If you happen to call in, you can call in. I'm watching the chat room. We're, we're going back and forth. Yeah, people don't in the, in the chat room don't understand. I can't do it. This is this is what the challenge is uh, for doing that. Let me start a show. There are no people here to help me, by the way. If you're wondering, why aren't the phone lines open? Because I haven't opened them. Uh, I have to type things in to make this happen. I'm the only one here. So I have to call into the phone lines, and then I'll put up the number in just a moment. But if you would just bear with me just a moment, it only takes a second for me to click through, have this pop up the right number. It'll go beep, 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 beep on my Skypey here. I know it's not Skypey. That's a, it's a long story. It's a long story. Do I do a pound sign? I think I do. There we go. Enter your six-digit PIN number. I will do that. And? Welcome. Welcome. See, that's what you like to hear. So that means that I can bring up... Oh, that kind of zoomed up a little bit, didn't it? Woo! Woo! I got to work on that. It's a little too close, I think. That's... that's No. Don't do that. So here's the phone line. If you want to call in, you can. Or I'll be taking questions from the chat room as well at professormesser.com slash live. That's where we are, slash live. That's where, that's where I'll take questions from in the chat in the live event chat. Or you can call in 1-855-785-7545 on Skype or Skypey. It is uh, absolutely free. You don't need any Skypey minutes at plus 1-855-785-RJ45. Um, how's the birdhouse? What a good question. Uh, I have a new, uh, a new employee, really more of an unpaid intern that's handling the birdhouse. Um, and the unpaid, un, unpaid, uh, intern, uh, extern is my, is my sons, both of them. They are now managing, they are now network and system administrators for the birdhouses. They're trying some different typefaces, trying to figure out how to make it look best during the day and at night. They're making sure that it's always up and running. They're always making sure there's food there. They're making sure that uh, the server's running properly, that it's got all the updates for the operating system, that it's configured the way we would need, that everything's running the way we would expect. And it's running great. Thank you for asking. In fact, we're thinking of putting up another one of these, another birdhouse. For those of you not familiar, this is in my backyard. So this is at birdfeeder.live. It's a 24-hour day, seven-day-a-week live stream of the bird feeder. And it's just something we, in our in our family, there's a lot of birdie people. So they like we like to watch birds. We have a lot of them here. 
Uh, so, no, I don't have an off-site backup of the Birdhouse server so much. Uh, but I do have the configuration backed up. So we do have that. Uh, yeah, it was, it's, uh, it's, it's a little windy out there. So the bird feeder is moving around a little bit. Uh, the, bird the bird feeder is in the cloud. The bird, <laughs> bird feeder is out there. It's all done with the YouTube Live. So it's a fun project that I did originally with my daughter, who's now in, in, uh, in a program. She's going to get her IT degree. So that's uh, something useful to have for that. For those of you asking, can you get an offline recording of this session? There will be a replay, video replay of this made available immediately afterwards when it is done. And the podcast version of this will be available probably near the end of the afternoon, a few hours after this. I'll do the editing right afterwards at professormesser.com slash podcast. And you can download those from the podcast page. You can play them on the podcast page, or you can subscribe with whatever, whatever podcast listener you like to be able to do. So that's another nice thing to have available. So yeah, the bird feeder has been, uh, been there really great. For those of you that are watching last night, this is a way to know whenever there's bad weather, you can really see things uh, happening. It's windy right now. So the bird feeder is shaking around quite a bit to have that there. Yeah, the podcast, that's a brand new thing. Podcast of these live study groups is available and I'll just updated them. We started uh, last month. So they'll all be there. So in the chat room, people are asking, am I planning a, a server plus? No plans for server plus at the moment. Not a, not a huge number of people asking for that, but I have noticed more people are asking for server plus lately. So I would love to know from you if you're interested in server plus, what's driving that? Is it a class you're taking? Is it, uh, are, there, are there employers that are asking for the server plus? Because I, I need to know these things. I want to find out. Uh, and I'll be glad to have a look because things I know, things always change. I never know what I might be I be doing in a year. I plans to know. I think I know what I'm going to be doing 12 months from now. But you never know uh, for that. I don't like so. I love servers. What are you talking about servers are uh, uh, servers are a huge part of what you do in this industry, uh, and I have plenty of them. What I hate are paying for servers which is the, that's the difference because I have to pay a lot for servers and I may have to, I have, may have to pay more. My servers are becoming overloaded. Uh, I ran into a problem this past week. We can talk about in a moment because first need to go to the phone lines, a nice person holding from the 901 area code. Are you there? Caller, what's your name? Oh, yes. Uh, my name is Fernando. Hello, Fernando. Thanks for calling. What can we do for you? Yes. Hey, Professor Messer. I have a question, but, uh, um, it's related to the way I'm preparing myself to get my uh, CCNA certification. Okay. Uh, see, I have never been a computer person, and uh, I am trying to learn all of this in a second language, right, which is English. My first language is Spanish. And so on top of that, it's the CCNA, which is hard. difficult enough as it is. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I was wondering if maybe you can give me an advice on how to how to study this or how to I'm supposed to be following like a, a course from uh, from the Metacad website so I have an instructor and you know I go to school and I have an instructor but he doesn't give us any lectures or anything he's just sitting there and you know if we have any questions we can go and talk to him but I'm not like I, I mean I don't trust him but you know, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, maybe maybe you can advise me on how to, you know, try to study this or, you know. Yeah, it doesn't sound much like an instructor. That sounds like a listener. You have a listener that sits in the room with you. <laughs> um, what, may I ask what your, uh, what your first language is? It's Spanish. Okay, so... There, there are a number of options available to you. Uh, fortunately, the Cisco mm -hmm. certification exams themselves are pretty, pretty well supported internationally. And there are uh, study materials that are written in Spanish. There are study materials in, in video form that I've seen in other languages as well. I don't know that I've seen Spanish language CCNA, but there's got to be some. Uh, there's just has to be. Uh, I would be I would be surprised where they're not. They may not be available online for free, but there are certainly some available. One of the things, if I could say, for the CCNA 
Um, and this would be for the CCNT and then the second exam that, that brings you up to be the CCNA is that it is so hands-on. It is very hands-on intensive. You really have to know your stuff with configuring the switches and the routers for that particular certification. It is a lot of people, I think, sometimes try to compare Network Plus to CCNA. There's no comparison. Those are two very different certifications. The, the CCNA, uh, not only when you're – sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm listening. Sure. The the thing that I ran into with uh, with looking at CCNA because I did get these certifications once upon a time. They've they've now expired. But back in the day, I was I was indeed Cisco certified. So one of the things I really liked was being able to get as much hands on as possible. One of the things Cisco did in the last few months, uh, maybe the last six months or so. I think they did this over the summer is they made their internal, what used to be their internal training application called Packet Tracer, they made it available to the world. So you probably already have this, you're already in a class, but for the people that are listening or watching, you can download Packet Tracer. They require you to get a subscription, not get a subscription, but to register on the Cisco website. It's absolutely free. And they allow you, they give you a license to be able to download and use Packet Tracer and be able to build out your own networks. It's a very uh, impressive application. It gets you through most what you need to do for your CCNA. There's a number of things that Packet Tracer doesn't do because it's an emulator, but it does so much that the few things it doesn't do are well eclipsed by the capabilities that are there. There are other books and other um, materials out there that are written in English and some that are written in Spanish. Get a good book. Um, I think the, the, the Cisco series, the Cisco Press books are good because they keep you on track with the, the things that Cisco absolutely thinks you should know. They're, they're in some cases perhaps not the most exciting books to read. They're very dry. And I can imagine if English is not your first language, they could probably be pretty tough to get through. Uh, so if you can find one that's written in, in a Spanish language book, that would be uh, useful. There are other books on CCNA and CCENT that are not written by Cisco that are still very good. Todd, Todd Lamley's books are very good as well. So those are at least a few options. My, my biggest recommendation, though, regardless of what book you get, get as much hands-on as possible. If your instructor is not really instructing, they're really looking for you to come to them, there are a lot of labs on the Internet that other people have written that go right into Packet Tracer and take you through a problem. Uh, a great community is on Reddit for the CCNA and the CCENT. I think in the sidebar, they even have links to hundreds of labs that are out there. Take advantage of those. Get as much hands-on as you can. Try to really understand what's happening on the network, and I think you're going to be okay. Okay. Yeah, and, you know, one of the things is that they, they do have the, uh, the course in, in Spanish. I've looked at it. Now, the problem is I'm becoming more familiar with the terms and the words in English because I've never heard these words in Spanish. Right. So I need to look for the definitions as well. That's, and, um, that does become a bit know, of a challenge. Of that, on, on, yeah, and then on top, of, on top of that course, I'm also taking a Unix, uh, a Unix course, and, uh, and I'm starting to get my, uh, my April certification, which is it's, it's just, I feel, like, I feel like somebody's throwing me a bucket of ice, and I have to catch all the ice. <laughs> so yeah. I am really overwhelmed. So, um, if it helps, from I, what you're describing, you should feel overwhelmed. Just doing CCNA is overwhelming. That is a huge amount of content to be able to get get your hands around. Throwing yeah. Linux on top of that is uh, is a monster. That it's its yeah. own world on top of that. And then A plus itself has its own set of requirements. I could not imagine doing all three of those at the same time. So you're going to have to break these up. Yeah. and do it by objective. Go to Cisco and get their exam objectives. Go to CompTIA, get their exam objectives. Break it out into smaller chunks and so that you don't start going yeah. off the scope. You're really going to have to focus your efforts. Yeah. And then, you know, I also work full-time, so my time is very limited. Right. And sometimes I fall behind on my assignments because I'm 
trying to focus on one thing. And then, um, you, you know, at least at least I noticed that in Unix, if you don't use the command, you know, you're just going to forget about it. And it, 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 <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's going to be challenging for me this year. But, uh, you know, I, I, I really want to get the certification and you know, start, start my career in the IT field. But, uh, you, I will tell yeah, you, just, you've bitten you off know, quite a bit. That's a lot for anyone to, I would not do Linux and Cisco and A plus together. Uh, given, given what I know about all three of those, you, one of these is probably going to suffer a bit. Uh, try to focus your efforts at least on one major one to get, try to collect as much information as you can from the other two. But if you don't end up taking and passing the exam the first time, I think that would be perfectly normal for your particular situation. Try to get at least one of those down really well, though. If, you, if you're good with Cisco and you're pretty good at the command lines with Cisco, try to focus on that and get as much as the others. You can always go back and retake a Linux Plus or a Linux certification exam. You can always go back and take any of these certification exams, but you're going to have to try to pick one yeah. and, and really get the bulk of that one down because trying to do all three of those at one time, I can't even imagine. Yeah, and um, you know, um, my well, I I, I I think that the first the first course the first course that I should have taken was probably the A plus certification because you know, like I told you in the beginning, I knew I I knew nothing about computers, and then I started taking this um, networking classes without even knowing what a memory RAM is, so. It's 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 been challenging, but uh, you know whatever it takes at this point, I I, I am like one semester away to get a, an associate degree on information systems technology, and uh, it's it's been really challenging. So I I can imagine, um, and I think you've got the right idea. I think you've got the right mindset to be able to get into this, mm -hmm. and and I I think you're right. But not everybody has the luxury of having them everything put in the perfect order. When I got my a, when I got my CompTIA certifications, I got my Security Plus first, then I got my Network Plus, then I got my A Plus. So I went backwards as well. It probably would have made sense for me to go the other direction, but we're not always in that particular situation. Well, I, I wish you the best yeah. of luck anyway. And if there are any other specific questions you're going through this, you can always visit the chat room on my website. Myself and other people are usually hanging out in there. We can try to help. Okay, awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks calling, Fernando. Take care. Thank you. Bye. There's a, there's a lot there. There's a lot there. Let's uh, appreciate you holding 786 area code. Thanks so much. What's your name? Hi, uh, Professor. It's Wakar. Hey, Wakar. You probably recognize my number by now. I know. You think I should have these all set <laughs> um, up? <laughs> I think you should. I really think you should open up a consulting company here. I'm right, not sure what time. Uh, maybe between 3 and 4 in the morning, I'd be able to do that. <laughs> Anyway, so um, my question was actually I just needed uh, some help. I was going to give my Network Plus exam in uh, about two weeks, and uh, I'd like to be ahead of uh, uh, what I'm doing. So I'm based in L.A., and I am really hoping to find an internship this summer. Okay. So I don't know where to look for internships because I know that you know I can't just apply for a job without experience. And there's no point of taking a certification if you don't have hands-on experience before applying for a job. Good point. So if you could just uh, tell me a couple of uh, sources and uh, or websites where I could just go and apply um, here in LA, if, or if there's you know something uh, that's uh, like Indeed or something um, that would really help. That's, Internships that's are tough for IT for the employers because the way employers will usually do this is they will get in touch with, they usually have a set of, of recruiters that they go to, headhunters. And they are getting headhunters in IT that are pulling in people for database administrators, network administrators, server administrators. And these are people that are making a significant salary. And generally the way this works is that if a, a recruiter brings somebody to a company and says, I've got the perfect person, and that person gets the job, the recruiter gets 
a, a, a percentage of what their first year salary would be. So the more valuable the person, the more salary that person would make, the more money the recruiter would make. Well, if you think about interns, you're not going to make anything. You're barely making minimum wage if that is an intern, assuming that a company is going to pay you, which they really should be uh, at a very minimum point. But they don't go to recruiters to find interns. The recruiters aren't going to have a list of interns anyway to bring to the company. So a lot of companies don't know how to get these. A lot of them will go to the local uh, schools, whether a college, a university, uh, and talk to the administrators that are there. Even if you don't go to that school, that college or university, it's worth communicating with either the undergraduate um, uh, undergraduate office there, or probably more specifically, the, uh, the undergraduate uh, school that handles IT type functions. It may be an engineering program, it may be a, um, a management information systems program, but talk to them and find out, are there companies that come by looking for interns? It's a phone call. It can't hurt. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't know. I know the people that handle that here. I can call any time. And they're just the nicest folks, and they try to figure it out and see if they can help you. Another thing you should really consider doing, and, and do it now before you have a degree, before you have your first IT job, start getting involved in some of these user groups. We may have even mentioned this in, an, in another study group with you, is that all of these companies that are looking for interns have people going to these user group meetings. It might be a Microsoft user group meeting, a Cisco user group meeting. It might be more of a generic security study group or an IT user group meeting. Uh, all of these you can usually find on Meetup. There are usually uh, the Google engine's pretty good for finding your local type of meetings like this, especially the big ones, VMware, Microsoft, Cisco. There's, there are probably many options in the LA area for finding user groups that are very geographically located. That is a great way to meet people. Even if you go, it's an hour of your time. It's an hour and a half. There's probably pizza. They're going to talk around. They have a, a formal presentation usually by someone um, who is also from a company that probably takes interns. And then everybody in the audience is going to be a company in your geographical area that also probably needs interns and certainly wouldn't mind you asking about it because that's what you do at these meetings. You try to meet everybody else in the area. The people that have jobs in your area go to these meetings so that they can meet everyone else. The, the IT uh, family of, of people, the, the number of people in IT is really not enormous. It's not a huge number of people. And geographically speaking, you start to figure out who's who in your area and uh, you can take a business card with you, just that you're a student, you know, that you're someone looking for internship, or you can just collect business cards from other people, but ask them, oh, well, I'm a student right now. This is great. I've learned a lot here tonight. Are, do you guys ever, uh, do you ever have interns? Are you ever looking for interns? Or is there someone at your organization I should talk to or send an email to, to get on the list whenever you are looking for those interns? Uh, people who are doing that, um, are able to make those connections. It is it is the people form of networking. And it's one that we shouldn't forget about when we deal so much on the digital side of networking is that who you know, is, as they say, really is just as port in, important or perhaps even more important than what you know. I think I mentioned on an earlier study group, my first job um, in technology was with a small company in South Miami that I got through just, just doing interviews. I didn't know anyone there. Every other job in my career, and there's been a few, have always been because I knew someone else who was there. Because you would much rather have someone come in to work with you that you know rather than a complete stranger that you have no idea how this is going to go. And if they've seen you at the user groups, they've seen you at a trade show that's locally. Certainly in L.A., they've got these local trade shows that you can go to. You can take a day and, uh, and meet the people at these companies that are at the trade show that are behind the desk, behind the booths, and find out what they are doing. Some of these very large companies like Cisco, like Microsoft, they certainly have interns. So it's worth getting to know the local folks in your area because whether they're at Microsoft or Cisco tomorrow, they might be at another technology company in your area and having you on their list. Can I join your LinkedIn? Can we link in together? That's a great way to keep up. LinkedIn is the way that 
uh, in the industry, we keep up with everybody else and are able to send messages. I've known people that I haven't talked to in years, but inside a place I was working, they said, you know, we have an opening in Chicago for this particular role. And I said, I know somebody in Chicago, haven't talked to her in a long time. Let me send her an email. Let me go to LinkedIn, send her a LinkedIn message. So it's a great way to just keep up with what's going on, get in front of people, have them know who you are, because I think that's your biggest challenge when you're just starting out is getting that way in the door. And that's a great way to do it. Right. Uh, but the, the only fear that I have, I live in uh, the Santa Monica, Venice area, and there's a lot of startups in this area. Oh, yeah. And I have been to a couple of uh, <laughs> hackathons that, you know, people have here on through Meetup. But I just, my fear is that just with a Network Plus certification, would they be willing to even listen to me, you know? And because I'm still going through college, I haven't been through, I'm, I'm almost... Uh, there but without a college degree they don't really um, take an interest if you know what I mean I do and that's so, why you have to be a little bit different than everyone else you have to go a little bit do a little bit more than what everybody else is doing I have been to so many of these user group meetings because I used to be on the vendor side and I was brought in to speak at these meetings and do a presentation a demonstration of technology show what the coolest latest stuff was in security protection and show people what some of these things did so I got to see the people that were there and uh, some of the people that were there have been in the industry for 30 years they've got this stuff cold but uh, very often I would find people that were local college students sometimes two or three would come to the meeting just to meet people that were at the meeting. It, it is an environment where you are not ostracized. They're not going to tell you to get out. They are very opening because it's a user group. They want to find out and also be able to teach other people what they know about the technology. Uh, so don't be afraid to go to these user group meetings. People would love to have you there because the more people that are there, the more interesting conversations you can have about these things. And uh, you're not going to have people tell you, I don't understand why you're here or why you're asking me that because you're just a student. Nobody would ever do something like that. And if they are, you you know exactly who in the industry you should avoid going forward. Uh, I find most of these environments are extremely open. Um, and you get to meet somebody, sit down next to them, introduce yourself. Do you come to these things a lot? Are you a member of this? This is my first time here. Uh, are there people here I should know? Uh, can we link in? It's a very common way to start networking. And I think most people are pretty open. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll do that and I'll, I'll get in touch with my school as well. I think that's but also a great also. idea. Did we lose you there? I think we did. I think that was it. I think our conversation was over. I think we were done with that. It's, it's really something I, it, that's probably one of the most popular questions I get, which is about how do I get my foot in the door? There was a great email. I know there's a caller holding. I apologize. We'll come right to you in a moment. But I got an email this week because last week I was talking about a technique I, I was reading uh, in a book. And the technique was was when you're in the interview and, uh, and they're asking, you know, the interview, they finished asking you questions. There's always that moment where they say, do you have any questions for us? And you should certainly ask some questions. But one of the things I mentioned there was that if this is a job that you want, it's not wrong to tell them that in the interview. And, and you may want to just tell them, you know, just, just since we're here talking, I, I really am impressed with your company. I like what you've told me about this job. I think it would be a great fit. If you offered the job to me right now, I would take it. That's how much I'm interested in getting this position. Just I wanted to let you know that. If just saying that goes a lot. Nobody's ever told me that in an interview. And if and I've done a lot of interviews. If somebody did tell me that in the interview, that would be pretty darn impressive. Uh, because that's your biggest concern as some as a hiring person is, am I going to hire somebody who's really into this? Or are they really just doing this because they're trying to get a, a number that they can go back to their boss and fight over their existing salary and then they don't take my job and I'm stuck at the beginning again? Uh, there's a lot of those types of things. That's not the only thing you have to worry about as a hiring manager, but that's certainly one of the things. And if you can really come out in the interview and say, yeah, I'm absolutely ready to work for you guys. If you will have me, I will be here. Uh, that's pretty strong. Um, and somebody did that the day after my last study group and got the job. So 
it works. I, I thought that was a great, great thing to have happen. So that's, that's really, uh, and I lost the person who was on hold. I apologize. But if you call back, I'll be glad to, to pick that up. I thought that was a great result of walking in there and, and telling people you were excited about what they were offering and that you would do that. So the, the chat room, people were asking, what was that website that we were talking about? It was Meetup, M-E-E-T-U-P, meetup.com. And uh, Meetup is, uh, is a way to find a lot of different places in your area. It's a geographical type environment. You say, here's where I live. And it'll tell you all of the different places. So Tallahassee Young Professionals, since I'm in Tallahassee, Florida, there is a Dance Till It Burns, the Western West Coast Swing Dance. Mm, people still do that. Uh, young Active Professionals. So all of these different, there's a Toastmasters. If you're someone who has a problem speaking, you want to learn how to speak better, they do that. So they're also technology. You can break this down technology as well. So it will tell you the different study groups. Here's a tech one. So I can explore the technology study groups. There's a capitalcity.net users group, Refresh Tallahassee, a startup grind of North Florida Ruby Brigade, Geodev Meetup Group, Bitcoin. So Tallahassee WordPress Meetup. I should probably talk to them. Technology grows. You can see how many people are involved in that. Learn to code. Salesforce developers, podcasters, data science. This is just in my little burg here in Tallahassee, Florida. In your larger geographical areas, this will be significant. So this is a great place to go to find some of these places that can really help you with uh, finding people who are doing what you want to do. So don't... Uh, don't limit that. Uh, it's some, some great, great things. See, people in the chat room found great dog walking groups. You can find all kinds of groups that meet up, uh, not just uh, the ones that are technology oriented. There's plenty of things there. And if you're, if you're looking for a job, you need to do something different. Get yourself out there. Get yourself available. Um, I saw, uh, just as an aside, um, in the in a, a, a message come up, one of the the news articles that I thought was pretty good. being in, being a part of the world that uh, does get hurricanes coming through during hurricane season. Just had a pretty bad storm last night. It was not a tropical storm, but I had a bad thunderstorm come through yesterday evening, and I uh, saw a message pop up on uh, TechCrunch that said Spotify and AccuWeather are going to team up. They have partnered together to create real-time playlists based on the weather that's outside. Um, I This is one of those things where I get to be the old crotchety guy and say, what problem is this solving? What are you doing? Spotify, I thought you were trying to IPO this year. What in the world are you working on? What, what are you trying to do? I have never in my mind thought, this weather, I wish I had some music to go with it. Uh, and by the way, do you want music to go with a storm? Wouldn't you want something snappy? Maybe that's what it is. The worse the weather gets, the higher the tempo gets. Maybe that's what it is. And they're going to they're gonna work, it, work it away that way. You'll feel so much better during the hurricane. That, that's not going to be an issue. There, I don't know. I'm not sure what they were thinking. Let's... Uh, Let's see what this person's thinking, though. Back to the phones, the 919 area code. Are you there, caller? What's your name? Uh -oh. Hey. Jerry. Hi, what's your name? I'm sorry. Hey, this is the very first time. Oh, my name is Jerry. Hi, Jerry. Thanks for calling. Yes, this is the very first time I contact you in the study group. Um, I'm sorry about that. I'm in the job right now, but um, I... Passed the A plus certification uh, like six, seven months ago. Nice. And yes, and I had a quick question on that um, that seven second subnet video that you um, that you showed us last week. Yes. Now the question now the question I have is: Do you have any type of exercises for us to do? Because I did like probably probably like three or four exercises that you illustrated on the video, but I want to grasp more hands-on. So I was asking, do you know any type of uh, information that I can search online so that way I can become more familiar with the subnetting? 
Yeah, one of the things that people told me, because the seven second subnetting is, the video is 20 minutes long, and people said, wait a second, I thought it was seven seconds. This is 20 minutes. But as you can see during the video, I did about four different subnetting exercises. So I tried to take you through some repetition there. And one of the things people have said was that uh, we need more of those. So I've considered building up some different subnetting exercises and doing a follow-up video to that, which I think would not be a bad idea. But I think what a lot of people should do, and this is what I did, is there are a lot of websites you can go to that will give you subnetting questions. And that will ask you, they'll give you a subnetting um, value. They'll give you a question and say, what are what is the first available host in this subnet? What is the broadcast address for this subnet? Uh, on the website, somebody even listed one subnet. If you go to Google and type in subnetting uh, practice, they'll give you a lot of a lot of options. Uh, subnettingquestions.com is one that somebody said in the website. And that's a pretty good one because it gives you kind of a broad question like, what is the valid host range? What valid host range is the IP address 172.16.253.230 slash 23 a part of? So that's perfect for my seven second subnetting. You can type that in. You can calculate the subnet, which will tell you the network address, the broadcast address, the first available and the last available IP. And then you'll know what the valid host range might be. And that's a pretty good one. And then you can click a reveal answer, and it will tell you what the answer is. So to see if your seven second process is working the way you would expect. And then you can click the next question, which is asking you for a broadcast address. I like this site and the way that it's asking these because now I can go through this list and try to figure out all of these different aspects of subnetting. It's not the same question over and over and over again. Those are, are very good ways to help test yourself. And there's a, I've used three or four different sites like this. I think they're pretty much all advertising driven. But you can really find the questions quite well in there and work through those questions. And it's a good sanity check to see if you've really got the process down the way you would expect. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, I would definitely, I would definitely work on that as well. Um, here, here goes another question too. Um, I remember I was listening to the A Plus Data Group, and it was a guy that was calling from uh, North Carolina, and he was mentioning about the Michael Myers book. Uh, I think I, I purchased the Network Plus book from Mike Myers, right? And I noticed that I was trying to figure out. Uh, I looked at your videos. Then I tried to look through his through your, through your, I mean, I'm looking at his book, and then I'll try to look through your videos, and then I was trying to do the uh, lab work as well. So the question I have is, which way is the best way to study? Because I'm more of a, um, when it comes to reading, I would like to read, and also I would like to work on labs at the same time. But sometime in between, if I get stuck on a, if I get stuck on something, I start to get it right. Yep, I'm the same way. And I, I like doing both of those too. I think when you're reading from a book, it's a different way of learning. You First, you can get more information in a shorter period of time because you're reading. Reading is a very quick way to, to gather information and stick it in your head. The videos are a good way to demonstrate some of the things that you've been reading. Videos obviously take a longer amount of time to get that same amount of information when you compare books versus videos. But it's a different way of learning in both of those. And I like to go through both of those and work through them as well. One of the problems I run into mm -hmm. when dealing with these third-party books is that the, the order that a book is laid out in is completely different than the CompTIA exam objectives. And, and rightly so, I will say. CompTIA puts a lot of information in their exam objectives, but they don't really lay out the exam objectives in a way that I think is very conducive to understanding fundamentals first and more complex things later. Uh, unfortunately, everybody has a different book. So I can't lay out my videos in a format that is perfect for everybody. There's just It's just impossible to do that. But fortunately, uh, the, the book manufacturers, the book writers and publishers will generally cross-reference at the beginning of a chapter and tell you this particular topic is one that is, this particular chapter covers topic number 2.1 and 2.2 in the CompT exam objectives, and then you can cross-reference against the videos that I have there. Uh, it's one that becomes a little bit of a challenge, though, because not always 
Is there a one-to-one -one relationship? Sometimes they take a little bit of one topic and a little bit of another topic somewhere else and crunch them into one chapter. And it's sometimes hard to find the right overlap between a book and a video. It becomes a little bit more of a challenge. Um, you kind of have to, to, in that case, just kind of struggle through and find out exactly where it is in my video list to find out where the content is. And I think you're right, getting as much hands-on is is really really useful um i think that's the thing that that really solidifies it in my brain because when i run the arp a and see what it's doing now i've got a better understanding of what that is rather than something i just read in a book i think you've got the right strategy i think it's just a matter of bringing everything together in a way that makes logical sense as you're learning it and i think following the book's a good way to do that Right, and I definitely, um, you recommend us uh, purchasing the Wireshark book, I purchased that too. I guess when I was looking at the video, I was so focused on trying to get this information um, down pat that I haven't had an opportunity to look through the Wireshark because I have so much study material that I have to, you know, that I have to do. Yeah, if you're interested in Wireshark, never, certainly, that's, that's probably your next step after you get the Network Plus stuff down. Uh, Wireshark, will pr getting detailed Wireshark is a good second step after that, I would think. Okay, and I'll purchase the lab work. I'll purchase the uh, GTS Learner Lab. Okay. I'll purchase that from you as well. That's great. Thank so, you. And th that's a good like resource that. right there. And you can run a lot of different things in that. Mm -hmm. So should I start with um, the lab or should I start with the Wireshark or just do like a combination of both? The way I like to do it is I like to read the book chapter first. I like to get a topic down from a book. And then I move over to the hands-on if there is a hands-on piece or go to the lab from there. Sometimes I have to follow it up with a video. Ironically, I don't like to necessarily watch a lot of video because I'm, I'm impatient. I'm, I'm the kind of person I like to use that little cog wheel at the bottom of YouTube and I speed up the videos to one and a half mm -hmm. times so that it goes through it really, really fast. Um, that that's the way I like to go through the videos, but sometimes the video will bring up a demonstration of something that I just don't have time to go to hands on. I can slow that down and go, okay, show me how to perform that ARP function and what you would get from that. Uh, that's where I get a lot of, of, uh, value from videos. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, I don't want to hold you up. I know you have some callers on the line, so I really, really appreciate your information so much. You make me learn a lot thanks jerry and, and keep me post on how it goes okay thank you professor take thank care you. that's that's okay. great well, we've got some more calls on the line i want to thank uh the 18 area code for hanging on thanks so much what's your name caller uh joey hey joey thanks for calling what can we do for you Actually, this is more just kind of uh, praising you in a sense. I just actually got back. I know this is a different topic. I know you're doing Net Plus right now, but I just got out of the A-plus certification I passed, and I Excellent. wanted to say it was just because of your material that I used. So a big thank you to you, man. I feel like on cloud nine right now. Congratulations. Well, I, I like to tell people I do the easy part. You're the one that has to go sit there and take that exam. So <laughs> I'm glad they were able to help in some <laughs> little way at least. Well, yeah, no, I mean, I, I purchased the uh, two, like the exam questions. Those really help because I was, those are like kind of like my enemy when I, I'm, I'm sitting there trying to read the question. And I think yep. your questions really help. It wasn't exactly identical to their questions, obviously, nope. but it really did kind of help mirror what I'm looking at, help me read the questions better because that always kills me. That's something and, I, um, I wanted to do. I, I didn't just want to duplicate what CompTIA does on their questions. I want questions that help you learn the material because then it doesn't matter. CompTIA could completely come out with a brand new pool of questions that are written completely differently. And if somebody, if I'm writing my mm -hmm. questions to emulate them, that's a waste of time. Yeah, no, exactly. And that is, that's, that's exactly what happened. It was just what happened was just those key little words they said in their questions. I was like, no, I've already, okay, I know exactly what he's talking about. So, boom, I already knew the answer. So it just helped so much. And of course, watching your videos. And I did purchase a, what's uh, that one book, a red book. I uh, can't even think of the name of it right now. It's a CompTIA cert book. And uh, so I did have a second reference, but again, right. I used mainly that in your videos and I always purchased the questions and yeah, man. So I just I just feel happy right now. I, I bet so, those are huge sorry, exams next. to take. Congratulations. That's uh that's fantastic news. I appreciate it. Well, I just want to say thank you, and I know you got other callers, so I'll just go ahead and just say thanks and appreciate everything. Thanks for the call, Joey. Take care. Thank you. Bye.
Always good to know when people are passing their exams. I love to get those emails, by the way. So if you pass your exam, hit that contact us link. I love to get those. I forward them on to Mrs. Professor Messer, who doesn't see me during the day because I'm hidden in this cave and, and writing content. I tell her, see, we're, there's, there's good stuff going on, just so you know, out there. Let's go to the phone lines, 559 area code. Are you there? Call her. What's your name? Hello? Uh, hello. Who's there? Um, my name is Ashraf. Hello, Ashraf. Thanks for calling. What can we do for you? Thank you. Um, I just want to hear um, your opinion on the um, new CompTIA certification exams, the CIA and the CAS. What, what do you think about those certifications? Because I'm thinking to take them next. I have the Network Plus in two days, and then I'm um, thinking about taking the Secure Plus by the end of this month, which is the 28th, I'm already scheduled. And then I just want to hear your opinion about the CASP and CIA. Well, the CASP, of course, has been around for years now. They're coming up on a, probably at least two years on that one, maybe three. Uh, CompTIA's first uh, big security uh, certification has always been Security Plus. And then about two or three years ago, CompTIA introduced a higher level exam, which is their CASP exam. You'll find it out on their website. They've got all of their exams listed. They have CASP listed under Mastery. So the, the CompTIA Advanced Security Practitioner, they really shot high with this CompTIA, the CASP exam, because they consider that to be the highest level security certification that they offer. But what they didn't have was something that was in the middle between CompTIA's Security Plus and the CASP. So on the 15th of February, so this would be next week, I guess, we should see the CASP, the, the CASP and the Security Plus will have a new exam that sits right in the middle of those two, and that's the Cybersecurity security Analyst Certification. Uh, this is one that has a lot of focus on knowing products. So this is the one where you'll need to know Wireshark and intrusion detection systems like Snort and Alien Vault for SIM, uh, to, to name a few. They give a few examples of that to be able to use these. Uh, and knowing what they are and how you're using it. It's a tough market for CompTIA. The security certification market, I've mentioned this in other study groups, is pretty mature. It's one that has a lot of people offering certifications, and CompTIA is just now getting into that. So they're trying to compete along those lines. I think what will be the key with the CSA Plus uh, and kind of the key with the CASP as well, because I don't see that CASP has really garnered the interest that perhaps other security certifications have, uh, but it's gaining. They're getting a little bit more as they go along. But the real key is going to be the hiring managers. If if hiring managers are looking for these certifications, then people will go out and they will get these certifications. Right now, I'm seeing a lot of interest in CSA+, Plus. a lot of people that think that they might be interested in taking this certification. Uh, but I'm not seeing a lot of people asking for people that have this certification yet. So I think the the topics that are in CSA Plus are good topics to know. Whether you have somebody asking for the certification or not, I think knowing Wireshark and knowing Snort and knowing a good SIM and understanding logs and being able to integrate all these things together is great practical knowledge to have for a security position. So this is one where uh, maybe it makes sense then for people to get the CSA Plus, even though there's not a big demand for CSA Plus certification holders. I love the idea of the content that they've put into it. I'm just going to wait and see. Probably in about a year, we'll be able to see what is the real popularity of this. Is this something that I would create content for? Because right now, I'm not seeing quite the uh, the, the groundswell of interest that I was hoping for at this point. Maybe I'll be surprised. Maybe I'm completely wrong with that, and somebody will be able to redirect me once this thing gets off the ground, and I'll be pleasantly surprised. Oh, thank you so much. And I'm sorry, the last question um, about my network plus, like I said, I'm, I have the exam um, uh, this Friday. So um, am I, how many labs am I going to have on the exam, like the number of questions I'm going to have about like lab on troubleshooting? We don't know for sure. The only thing CompTIA tells us when we sit for the exam is you might get a maximum of 90 questions, 9-0. Uh, it might be less than that. And from what people have told me, it very often is less than 90 questions. But usually 
not fewer than 80, somewhere somewhere between 80 and 90. Maybe it, it depends on the, the question pool and what you get. The number of performance-based questions, however, can vary. Uh, some people get uh, a, a small number. Some people get a large number. Some people have come back and said, I got eight performance-based questions, which I thought was a little excessive. Um, and what I find is that CompTIA tends to adjust these things over time. So what happened in December may not be the same thing that happens in February. But generally, that's that's what we tend to hear from people that are taking these exams. You should be prepared for at least a handful of performance-based questions that are different than something that might be multiple choice. OK, thank you so much for your answers today. Thank you so much. Uh, best of luck. That's one challenge, of course. You never know exactly what you're going to get on the exam. And I think we're now reconnected. Did, did we lose you before? Yes, you did. Sorry, I'm sorry about, about, that. about that. No worries. No worries. Did you have another question? Yes. So um, it was, uh, I, I was just uh, looking at the video. Um, and so the CSA, so I have a friend that works in um, Dubai and he, he's a, he got his degree in computer engineering and um, he's more inclined towards security. And um, so he told me that you should get your network plus and then you should move on to uh, getting the CEH, the Certified Ethical Hacker, and then get into uh, uh, offensive security. Um, so do you think this is a good path? If, if I could just get a little um, advice from you, if I am pursuing security, where do you think I should go? Should I stick to CompTIA or should I take the path that my friend told me? Don't don't stick to any one security certification provider when you're going down this path. In IT security, and this would be the group of people that manage the firewalls, they manage the intrusion detection, they probably manage content filtering and URL filtering, they set up VPNs both for client-side VPN and site-to-site -site VPN. They're setting up a uh, um, uh, an infrastructure for their security devices, their firewalls that are redundant. Uh, they're making sure they are logging all of these things and creating reports from all of these logs. It's really people making sure that everything continues to run, and yet all of the data is secure. They have a very broad job description. It's probably the most common job description in IT security is that IT security role. Uh, these people are not generally uh, penetration testers uh, by themselves, but they will often do some penetration testing within their environment, along with all of those other things I just mentioned. Um, so it's really a, a multifaceted position when you get into security. The one thing that I tell people that are getting into IT security is get the best foundation in networking as you can. Everything I just mentioned, having redundant firewalls, connecting up firewalls, generally they're connected up at layer three, so they're performing routing. They're usually routing to the internet. They're on the outside, so there's BGP routing, usually some other type of routing inside. Uh, you're connecting to a lot of switches, so you have to understand how to integrate that with the switching mechanisms. You also are connecting to IPsec VPNs that would be with a partner, so you have to be able to understand the networking that's going to happen between you and that partner. It's, it's just this huge foundation foundation of networking that is extremely good to have when you're trying to get into IT security. Um, it is one, not, not everybody has to have that, but boy, it really helps when you're getting into security. So generally, I tell people, get the foundational security certifications. Sure, Security Plus is a good example of that. But once you are there and you're really interested to get into IT security, you're going to also want to supplement all the additional security certifications with a good bit of, of networking foundations, whether it's from Cisco or anyone else. Cisco tends to be the largest one out there for networking certifications right now. So they're, they're generally an obvious next step when you're trying to get certifications in networking. Uh, I've said on other uh, study groups that I am someone who would not take an exam the, that would not take the the CEH exam, the Certified Ethical Hacker. Um, not because of the content of the exam, because I actually think the Certified Ethical Hacker exam objectives are very good. They really meet very well the things that will help you when you're getting into security. The problem is that um, the group that, that handles the CEH exam have had uh, 
breaches of security in the past that have caused private information of people taking the exam to be made available to people on the internet. Um, and that's something that that happened more than once. And whenever you're taking the CEH, there's a there's a set of requirements that the EC Council requires. You have to give them a uh, uh, you have to give them a picture ID, a copy of your driver's license, a copy of your passport, uh, along with other things. And what has happened is that they have had their security breached, and then people's passports and driver's licenses are suddenly available on the internet. Um, these are very public breaches. You can Google around uh, the EC Council breach. Um, the, the most notably, uh, the last hackers broke in and put Edward Snowden's passport out on the web. So it was one where made made me think that this would probably not be people I would give my personal information to. But I really like the content of the exam. So that's the trade-off. I think that's really the market CompTIA is trying to get into with the CSA Plus, is they're trying to get into that practical side of security and hopefully do that in a way that's much more secure and people don't have to worry about their private information. Um, that's that's the challenge back and forth. And that's why I, uh, I often say in a, in a kidding mode that the CEH exam is a unique exam because it tells you what you can do with your personal information once it's put on the internet and it's something you may be able to use very quickly after getting your certification uh maybe they've corrected all of their problems maybe they no longer they've tightened things down maybe it's a different ship maybe they've got different people in charge maybe maybe but i'm not giving them my personal information at all uh that that would be up to you that'd be your own risk that you would be taking for that uh, but I like what's on the exam. So I, I'm kind of torn because I like the content of the exam. I just don't like who's giving it. So what would you recommend then? After Network Security and Security Plus, what's the next step? Uh, SANS or? I like the SANS stuff. I've been, I've been working with SANS and taking SANS classes for many, many years in the industry. I don't take them much anymore. Uh, but I used to be in that role where I was going through, and there's solid, good training classes that are well respected in the industry. Um, so that's that is a certainly a good place to look at. What am I going to do with training, and working with those? Um, the uh, you mentioned another series of exams. Which one was that? Um, that, that was, was uh, OSCP, wasn't it? Yes, okay, that that's another one that's very highly regarded in the industry, and they have a series of exams that takes you from the lowest level and back up. The one that probably is the most common one that people are looking for is the CISSP. That's one you should be striving for. It's not one you can take right off the bat uh, because it requires a lot of practical experience before you can even take that exam. Uh, but it is well respected in the industry as well. And they have lower level exams that don't have quite that requirement or prerequisite before taking the CISSP. That may, that's from uh, ISC Squared. You might want to look at what they offer as well. The, they're well respected too in the industry. Okay. All right. So um, after the comp, I'm done with the comp PA, I should uh, look towards SAMS. That's what you're saying. I think any any of the ones that are going to be practical and kind of get you networking and security at the same time would be a good place to go. I would almost say that if you're if you're trying to jumpstart in security and there's a position waiting for you somewhere, yes, pursue the security certifications. Don't neglect the networking is probably the thing I can tell you the most because that's what's really going to help you the most when it comes to actually implementing these security technologies. Okay. All right. And how much of a role does programming play, like Python or Ruby in security? People will tell you that it plays a lot. I will tell you in practical experience, it played almost none. Um, there <laughs> are, uh, and that's just sort of the practical side of things, is that there there is a, a pretty big separation in IT itself. Uh, there's, there's information technology, and then there's computer science. And we generally put the operations of I, of technology in the IT side, and we put programming on the computer science side. Now, certainly, in anything that you do in IT, having a knowledge of how to do some scripting, how to perform some automation is incredibly valuable. It helps you a lot in different things that you will do in your job roles. But um, 
have, knowing the details of how to use Python are not something that is something that is a universal requirement. It is something that I see a lot being used in cloud-based environments. If you were a cloud provider and you needed some way to uh, integrate all of these different systems together, because here's here's how this, this Python works into the big scheme of things. Uh, you are a cloud provider and you are someone, or you have a cloud that you've built, maybe you have a private cloud and you're a big company and your business gets very busy during the end of the month. During the beginning of the month, not so much. But during the end of the month, your servers start getting hit a lot more. There's a lot more activity on your databases. Whatever application you're running gets a lot more activity. So having a cloud is great because you can build out a new web server, slide it right into the mix, and now you're balancing the load, and, and now it's better for everyone. Well, there's a lot of automation. The, the idea behind the cloud is you should be able to hit a button or even better, have the cloud understand when things are getting bad, have it automatically deploy a new server, configure it with the proper addressing, integrate it with the proper firewalling, configure it. There's never just one server. There's always a web server and a database server. Maybe there's a middleware server. All of these things deploy at once. They're all addressed properly. They all have the proper licensing. They integrate perfectly with all of the servers and the load balancers that are already there. And ideally, you never had to touch anything. The only way you're going to do that is if you script it, you automate it, you add checks and balances, and you're able to manipulate how those systems are configured prior to putting them into production. And the way that we have pretty much decided as an industry is that we're going to use Python to do that. And that's not a bad solution because Python is oh. something easy to learn. It's got a lot of flexibility. It's, it's almost tailor-made for that kind of function. So I get it. Hardly anybody's doing this, though. Hardly anybody uh, is actually realizing that pie-in-the-sky automation benefit that was supposed to come from putting your private cloud in place and knowing Python. Um, it's a very niche thing to know and to re be required to know. And then on top of that, extremely difficult to start implementing. Um, there are certain companies that I have visited, though, where that's all they do. So I get it. Yes, you need to know Python. You need to understand these cloud technologies. You need to be able to understand and integrate with all these APIs. Absolutely. For a lot of people in IT security, you're never going to need it uh, today. That's, the, that's where we are as we sit here today. I don't have to programmatically access what my firewall is doing and change things in the management of it. I don't have to programmatically uh, query my uh, SIM device to create an on-the-fly report and present it to me on a web page. I can just go in and click it and tell it to give me the report. Um, there are places where that is a benefit, but for the vast majority of IT security professionals, programming in its most, most uh, simple sense is is not as important as being able to do some basic scripting uh, and be able to at least handle at least some automational functions. But I I don't see where understanding the details of Python are going to help me right now in IT security. And but but as I said, because I'm going to emails about this, so let me put my caveat at the end. If you know Python and you know Perl and you can script in a web server. It just helps you that much more. There are things you can do with that. I get it, uh, but certainly not a requirement. Okay, all right, sweet. Well, that was helpful. So, um, all right, if I have any further questions, I'll, I'll, I'll call you or email you or something. But thank you for your help. Absolutely. Thanks for calling. Thank you. And that, uh, boy, does that bring us down to the second hour? We've gone over, gone over time. When's the last time you heard we went to overtime? I don't know. That's. For some people, that was a good thing to hear. For some people, that was not a not a good thing to hear. Um, so in the chat room, real quick, though, uh, somebody was asking, because this has come up before, um, uh, you have GNS3 and your packet tracer is one better than the other. Um, obviously, I know too soon. Sorry, guys. Uh, GNS3 and packet tracer are very different animals. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Packet Tracer is a network emulation environment where I can stick a bunch of routers on the screen. I can stick a bunch of switches on the screen. I can put computers on the screen. I can send traffic across the network. I can freeze it in time. I can watch as packets and 
and frames go back and forth across the network. I can inject and change things on the fly. It's a great environment, but it is virtual. And it does not have all of the, the, um, the features and the, the operating system functions that a full-blown router and a full-blown switch would have. It goes pretty far. Don't get me wrong. When I say it doesn't do everything, I mean it doesn't do like 2% of what you might need for a CCNA. Uh, but it's really good on, on Packet Tracer. GNS3 is taking actual router firmware and running it. So it's effectively emulating the hardware of a switch and of a route, well, of a router. Um, when it does that, you obviously have full capabilities there, but it requires that you have the code from a router to be able to do that. So you have to be properly licensed for the router to be able to have the code to put it into GNS3, which immediately takes it away from anybody who's just getting into learning this. Nobody has a Cisco router sitting around. They can pull the code off and legally use that inside of GNS3. So that's the, the problem is that you 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 have this uh, licensing issue with GNS3. Some people don't care about licensing. Uh, they're just going to get the code from anywhere and run it. I don't I don't play that way. I like to be legit when I'm doing something. And quite honestly, Packet Tracer does 98% of what you need to do. That's one, one thing that works fine. Um, and I get it. Yes, GNS3 does other things. It does some Juniper. You can integrate it with Wireshark. It absolutely has some extended capabilities. And I think that's great. You can bring up a virtual machine and integrate that into your GNS3 network and use it that way. It is. It's a nice little application to be able to use it that way. Um, and if you don't have hardware to use, that's a pretty darn good option. Although now that Cisco has opened up the licensing for Packet Tracer, and it's just so easy to use, and it, there's a lot of moving parts with GNS3. You have to get it going. Uh, Packet Tracer, you just run it, and it works. So there's some benefits there as well. There's a complexity. There's a learning curve of GNS3. It's a little bit more than the learning curve of getting into Packet Tracer. Both are very good, though. They're just... It just depends on your particular situation, what you're more comfortable in running. And I think you're you're fine either way. Run one of them if you're learning Cisco. Make sure you're getting a lot of hands-on. I've not used the uh, the boson. Somebody asked about the boson simulator. I've not used it before. Um, that's not true. Uh, originally, I did use that when I studied for my original certification. And it was pretty good. It's another emulator. Um, that that is it really is a simulator. It's it's uh it's one that is not a full blown router. It's just the functions within it. In fact, I found some bugs in it with OSPF. But that was that was that was a long time ago. That was moons ago. Um, and it, it, all I really did was stop OSPF and start it up again. It worked fine. Um, but those are those are things I think that find the one that works for you. It doesn't matter which one you use. Use one of them. They're all very good for getting your CCNA. Once you get past CCNA. Routering and switching, and you're getting into CCNA security, you're getting into CCIE, you're going to need some hardware when you get past those. Um, but, but for getting that CCNA, either one of those will work fine for you. And I found Packet Tracer, the one they put out that's available now, uh, even the shortcomings aren't enough to, to, to really stop you from learning what you need to know. It's pretty powerful to be able to have that there. Um, other questions? You said there's one more question? Yes, I got time for one more question. Make that one, throw it into the chat. Don't ask if you have time, just throw it in there. And you always ask later as well. For those of you that are watching or listening, I'm usually hanging out in the chat room on the website. We have a 24 by 7, seven days a week. Always there, chat on professormesser.com. You're welcome to stop in. There's a general chat, just one big chat room. And someone's usually in there and we can answer questions or at least uh, they'll be in there and other things we can talk about. There's all kinds of weirdness going on usually. But if you ask a legitimate question, you usually get a legitimate answer back. We don't answer homework questions, but we can answer other things that are in there as well. It tends to be helpful to have that there. Let's uh, get rid of that phone line so that because we're going to we're going to take this last question from the chat and then we'll uh, we'll shift over um, and kind of close things up for for the week. It was a good week. I saw for security. I'm going to talk about security next week in the Security Plus Study Group. Uh, but there was that uh, there was that great uh, article that came out. There was a parody article about the the Department of Defense requiring you to change your password every day, and you had to use uh, a 27 
uh, had to be 27 characters minimum, and you had to use a different character for each one, which I thought, but wait, there's only 26. They Okay, it was a spoof. I get it. Uh, for, the, for there it is. Um, so the question in the chat room, uh, the, yep, you're in a class. The whole class is trying to get a paid internship. Well, that's good, isn't it? Everybody applied. You all got interviews. Only one of you will get it. Uh, how do you handle it? You don't want to end friendships. Boy, are you in the wrong business. Uh, no, that's not true. Somebody's going to get that internship, and it's going to be great when they do. Um, and and here's the important thing. One benefit you have right now is that you're in this class, and everybody is now working. You know everybody in there. You're all working towards this internship. Somebody's going to get it. Whoever gets it, fine. That's good for them. Uh, the more important thing is that you know the person who now has this job, uh, and they're going to get other clues of internships. They might even be offered a job at that company, or they will be in the company. So you now know somebody in that company. So make sure you like that person. Make sure you connect with them on, on LinkedIn. Make sure you keep up with what they're doing. You may find out oh, this is not a good company to work with anyway. This will be your, your mole on the inside. Um, and find out one of those to, to be in there. I think that's a, a, a challenge when everybody's up for the same thing. But look around. There's probably other internships out there that your whole class isn't going after that nobody knows about yet. There's got to be other things available that you can talk about. And don't forget about the um, don't forget about what I said earlier. If you really like if you legitimately really like this internship and they're interviewing you, you can tell them I'm really impressed with what you're doing. If you ask me now. Uh, to join you and take this internship, I'd absolutely do it. I think this is great. Um, that's 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 something I think is a let people know you really like the job. And in, in an interview, we often have this position of we don't want to let them know how interested we are, or else we're not going to be able to ask for a lot of money. I need to pay play hard to get. Uh, doesn't work that way. Somebody's trying to hire you. They want you to be excited about the company. Tell them what you found on their website that you got you excited about what they're doing. Ask about these projects that are going on. Ask about the things that were listed in their last set of corporate uh, financial results. Uh, because in the financial results is more than just financials. They talk about projects. Oh, I see that you're expanding into Europe. What is that about? How is that going? Is there a different group of people doing it? Are you guys having to handle that from an IT perspective? Do you have IT people over there? I know some people in this country that you're going to. You know, those are good things to know. Uh, make sure you're completely aware of that when you walk in. Um, they, they need to remember you when you walk out the door. Hey, that guy knew all about the project we had going on in Europe that's going sideways. Uh, he, needs, he needs to come on board and help us with that. That can help you as well. Uh, don't ever uh, play uh, someone who's not excited about that role, if you really are. Now, if you're not excited about the role, well, sure. That's like, thanks so much for your interview. I'm going to I'm going to go get some lunch. Uh, that's that's probably a worst case scenario. Before you walk in, you should be really understanding what the roles are, how what the comp know what the company does. Uh, I walked into an insurance company and interviewed. I had no idea what they did. You're an insurance company, life insurance. Okay, I'm just out of college. I'm not sure exactly what term life is. Uh, but I'm sure it's going to be important because I know I have to create IT systems for it. You know, those you don't want to be in that position that I was in. Learn about what they do. Find out about the projects going on. They're pu you're generally public information. There's articles written in the paper if they're good at it, if they're good at marketing. Uh, that, that is a bit of a challenge and having that there. I agree. So good luck to you and good luck to the other folks that are in your class as well. Well, that brings us to the end of our after show. I want to thank everybody for joining us for the first hour. Thanks for hanging out for this extended uh, second hour. We're into the now third hour of talking in all of this. I really couldn't do it without you. Uh, this is one where every month we're doing this. If you want to find out when this next event is, make sure you follow us and join us uh, on the website at professormessage.com slash calendar to get the latest events. For those of you interested in the next study group, we have another one next week at this time. Our Security Plus study group will be Wednesday at noon my time. I hope to see you there as well. And I want to thank you for joining us on the Network Plus study group. Thanks, everyone.